Αυτό, αυτό. Όχι, να αφήσω τα μου. Ναι, ναι. Κάτσε σου πω λεπτό μου Έχω, έχω, έχω. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we started today's session with uh, this uh, uh, works on uh, workshop. Uh, Francesca will tell us about uh, the cosmological simulation, etc. Something that is very interesting for all of us. So, Francesca, start. Let's go. Thanks, Panos. Okay. Good morning, everyone. So, um, I thought I'd. Um, start this um, in this session, basically give you a little bit of um, uh, a feeling for how you can use um, some of the publicly available cosmological simulations. Um, in particular, I'm gonna be telling you, so there are different suites of cosmological simulations that are publicly available that you can use. Um, you might uh, know already about um, illustrious TNG. Um, there's also the Eagle simulations that are um, publicly available to use. They have their own interface. And also the Ariga uh, cosmo cosmological zoom-in simulations that I was telling you about on Tuesday, they are also now uh, publicly available. So um, I thought I'd uh, show you a little bit about how you can use these. So for those of you who have not used these before but are interested in using them, can get a little bit of a taste of this. So just to start, if you um, Google Auriga public data release, you'll come to um, this page here. Um, it's hosted over here. Um, and there's a lot of information on this page. So downloading the data is um, not super, super trivial. It's, it's easy, but you need to go, you need to download it via this Globus file transfer service because this is very heavy data. It lives on the cluster in, um, in Germany and you basically need to just set up an account on Globus and ask to download uh, the data onto your local cluster or your laptop. Um, I'm not gonna go through that because that's, I think it's self-explanatory, but 
once you go on to Globus. But if you have a if you do have a hard time, you can always write to me or to Rob Grant, and um, we can help you if you're if you're having difficulty. So just to say that on this page, there's a lot of information about the data. There's some very high level information that I'll go through here. Um, you can see a thumbnail gallery. And then also um, in here, if you go in data specifications, there's uh, again, a lot of information that you can read here. A lot of this is also in the tutorial. And here there is some extra additional data, high level data that you can use as well. So there's a lot of stuff here, you can play around. Um, okay, so for today, um, on the HERA webpage, if you, um, if you go click here, um, this will take you to this Google Drive folder here. And we're gonna be working with this uh, Jupyter Notebook uh, here. So if you click on the Jupyter Notebook, um, this is the, uh, the, the first thing you'll see. So just to say this tutorial is based on a tutorial uh, developed by Rob Grant at another uh, school, and I've just adapted it for our purposes today. And um, I hope you all have your laptop. So basically what uh, I would like you to do is to, um, in your own uh, Google Drive, uh, folder in the Google Collab folder, which is usually called something like My Drive Collab Notebooks. Um, you can create your own directory called Hera24. Um, and then there's some information here about how to link um, the the data. So in here, in the in the Google Drive folder, I've put the the simulation tutorial that you will copy over. And then um, in here, there's I've downloaded some snapshots from these simulations for you to work with. So um, if you um, if you create a, a, a folder in your Google Collab, um, you can create a soft link to the data um, by right clicking on the folder um, on this folder here, simulations. So you right click there. And then just um, do organize, add shortcut, and put that into your Hera24 directory. And then you'll be able to access um, these simulation outputs. And then just make a copy of this Hera24 simulation tutorial.ipymb in your own directory, and then you can edit it directly. So um, I'll give you a minute to do that. Um, so are, are people finding everything okay? Yeah, we might have a problem with the Wi-Fi. I don't know if that's going to be, yeah, yeah, OK. Sorry? Well, I think it's a bit, the, the Wi-Fi is a bit slow sometimes, so maybe people might have a problem with the Wi-Fi. Are people able to connect or no? Okay, so the other thing we can do um, is, and what I actually wanted to do is to work through this tutorial, I think the best thing would be that we uh, split into um, three groups. Um, so can I ask, how do we do this? Um, so can you guys at the back there, can you split, can half of you come here and the other half go on the other side and we'll make three groups so one group at the back here one group here and one group here and then we'll work you guys can work through the tutorial uh all together we'll work, we'll work through it all together so it's going to be like a class today 
Okay. And yeah. No, we're 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 moving. So half of you guys are gonna come over here. Half of you guys are gonna go over there. Alex, maybe you can go with them. Paula, do you want to come with these guys? Oh, no, Paula, maybe you can come with these guys over here and Thomas can stay there. Okay. Okay, so um, as we'll, what we can try and do is maybe have not everyone on the Wi-Fi. I don't know if that will help. Um, so we have these three groups. We're going to work through the tutorial. And um, Thomas over there, raise your hand. So Thomas will be helping this group over here, um, who is, uh, has a lot of experience working with the data. Paula over here, who is another uh, expert on using Ariga, will be helping over there. And Alex over there will be helping uh, uh, people back there. Just, uh, just to let you know, um, Alex, uh, Thomas, and Paula have also seen this tutorial basically for the first time today, so they, they don't uh, know uh, the, the answers to the, to the exercises, but they, they have experience using the data so they can help you out. Um, and we'll, have, we'll do a little bit of a competition. So we'll have Team Athena, Team Hera, and Team Zeus, and whoever can work through the, exercise, uh, the exercises first gets kudos, <laughs> congratulations. Um, okay, so I'm gonna walk you through the basics, which is at the, which is at the beginning of the tutorial. So have people been able to copy the tutorial, the, the Jupyter Notebook into their local directory? Yes. The data you can just, so if you, yeah, the data you just need to create a shortcut to your directory. So you can create a, this here. So you create a soft link by right clicking uh, the folder um, and doing organize add shortcut and then add a shortcut of this folder. Uh, so you add the shortcut in your own directory of the simulation. So that will just be a shortcut, but you can access the data. And then the only other thing you need to copy into your directory is this, this thing. You're still trying to do the shortcut? Like it won't, the Wi-Fi won't let you do it? Okay. I mean, maybe if you guys have like one function that you <laughs> work together. 
Okay, does each group have like one person that's, who's managed to copy the Jupyter Notebook? Yes, at the back there. Almost. Okay, okay I'll um, talk you through a little bit of this and hopefully you, you, you guys managed to, to copy it over. So, so, um, yeah, so this tutorial, by the way, um, is basically an edited shortened version of, there's the same tutorial on the um, public data release website as well. So there's kind of the same thing, but with also a lot more stuff in it. Um, so, uh, and I will make that also available in the uh, same Google Drive folder at the end of this. So you also have that there for easy access, but basically everything is is in here in this uh, website in the public data release. Oops, where is it? Data access, yeah, in here. Okay. All right, so the um, Arica Zoom and Simulation Project is, uh, as I was telling you, there is um, uh, 40 Milky Way mass simulations. Um, and the way, um, and, and the simulations have um, a very complete galaxy formation model with reionization, metal line cooling, star formation, stellar feedback, all of these nice recipes that go in there. And as I was um, explaining uh, the other day on Tuesday, basically how these are run, you start with a, a large volume simulation. This is based on the Eagle simulation. And then you pick some halos that you want to re-simulate at much higher resolution. And this is how the um, Ariga sample was selected. Okay, so there is a lot of information in here. I'm not gonna go through it in detail because it's a lot of information and you don't need to know all of this information in detail to, to be able to work with the data, but basically the snapshots um, of Ariga, they're written over multiple HDF5 files because these are very big um, like data products and you need to load all the files in order to read these in. But don't, don't worry about it because basically the 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 library that we'll be using in this Jupyter Notebook and that you can use, it's a Python library, it does all of this for you. So you just need to use the functions that are in here and it will load all the data in the right way, et cetera. Um, and there's, um, so this is maybe one of the things just to keep in mind. So every snapshot, HDF5 snapshot, contains several types of um, particles. And so gas in the simulations is, is type zero. Um, dark matter particles, the high resolution dark matter particles are type one. This is the only kind of dark matter particle you're gonna really be wanting to work with. There's also the lower resolution dark matter particles that are in the background in the, in the box, um, type two and type three, but you, you don't wanna be using those. Um, and then the star particles and the wind particles are both type four and the black hole particles are type five. So depending on, you can, when you load the snapshot, as you'll see in a bit, you can load all the data types together, or if you can also just load one data type, if you only want to wait, work with stars, you just load the stars, it will be quicker, there'll be less stuff in memory. Um, and the, the, the raw data in the, in the HDF5 files is in co-moving coordinates, but you don't, again, don't need to worry about that because the analysis package that we use automatically converts everything to physical units. Um, and, and here you can see some kind of information that is um, some of the fields and attributes that are common to all the particles. So things like coordinates, position in the box, um, the potential, the particle IDs, the velocities, the masses. So this is something that's common to all particle types. And then, for example, the stars have a lot more data fields because they also have things like abundances and a bunch of other things. Um, yeah, for the star particles, it's important to keep in mind that each star particle represents a single stellar population. Um, so each star particle is of the order of 10 to the four solar masses and it represents a stellar population. So each particle is itself a population of stars that has an age and a chemical composition. And then basically you can imagine that in the star particle, you assume an IMF 
And then that tells you how much, how many supernovae, for example, will go off from that star particle. And so each star particle has all of these different uh, properties like the metallicity, um, the inherited chemical abundances from the gas cells it formed from, um, the time it formed, so the time of the, the star particle formed, et cetera. Um, and there is these chemical elements that for each star particle, these are traced in the simulation. And the cooling depends on the abundances of each of these elements. Um, okay, and then there's some header attributes like box size, mass table, we won't go through all of these. Okay, so let's get to this part here, which is the actual hands-on working part. So working with the data. So, um, to analyze the data, we're going to use this publicly available Python package that was designed uh, for working with Ariga. Um, and the first thing you need to do is to um, mount this, to import this drive thing for Google Collab to be able to work in Google Collab. So you need to do this and it will probably then ask you to sign in and give permission to Google to all your life and all your files and all of these things which I'm guessing most of you have already done if you use Gmail. Um, so yeah, you need to click there. Um, I'm already logged in, so it just, it just uh, executes that. But if you, if you do that, it will probably ask you the first time to, to log in. Yeah, and sorry, I forgot to mention at the beginning that we're working on Google Drive and on this thing called Google Collab, which is basically, as you can see, um, somewhere where you can run stuff on the cloud on Google. You can run these Jupyter Notebooks. Um, but you can also just download this Jupyter Notebook locally and work with this also locally, right? Okay, have people been able to execute that first thing, that first command? Yeah? Group over here. Uh, Hera, Hera group. No, it's not running. Okay. Athena group, have we been able to execute the first command? Yeah? Okay, I'm gonna, if you need me to stop or slow down, just say so, yeah? Otherwise, I'm just gonna kind of keep going. Okay, so um, basically, yeah, just we're pointing things to the right directory. Um, you will have in your directory this ipine B and you should have a soft link to the, the simulations. You won't yet have this Arika public thing. And now you need to clone the Ariga public analysis package repository. Um, so I already have a, a, a folder there, so that's why it, it's not doing that for me, but it should do that for you. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay, and then you just tell the directory you want to work with. So here, um, this is um, the 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 sim so this is in the simulations directory, and that you'll see that there's there's Halo seventeen and Halo six. So we we can start by working with Halo seventeen. 
but you can later change this to Halo 6 and work with Halo 6. And then we just want to import the, um, the Ariga public package into uh, this Jupyter notebook. Um, Okay, and then um, further down here, you see these are some of the functions that uh, we're using. So for example, we're gonna use um, the load snapshot class, and this just describes the, the input parameters and what it returns. Again, you, you don't really need to know the details of that, but it's, it's just written there so you can see um, what it does. And also a load snapshot header. Um, and basically now we're going to do this load snapshot thing. So we're going to load the snapshot in. So load in the data, and you can hear that you can see that um, the we're loading here the snapshot number one twenty seven. Oh yeah, one thing I forgot to mention is that in this public data release, the you have one hundred and twenty seven snapshots. One hundred and twenty seven is the snapshot that corresponds to Redshift zero. Um, you see we're loading here particle type four, that's the stars and the, these wind particles. The wind particles um, are basically how feedback is done in this code, but we're gonna get rid of those and just keep the star particles. You'll see that in a bit. And then these are the attributes that we're gonna load, the coordinates, the velocities, the time that the star formed, so the age of the star, um, the initial mass, the mass today, the particle IDs, the potential, and the metals. Um, so this is what's gonna be loaded now from the snapshot. And then we need to, um, then we need to use something um, that is uh, used in um, cosmological simulations, which is this um, the subfind information. So when we load the snapshot, we lo we load the raw data in the in the in the box. So this is just the positions and velocities of the particles, etc. But then um, what we want to do is there will be lots of different halos in that simulation. It's a cosmological simulation, um, and what we want to do is we want to center ourselves on the halo of interest. So if we want to work with the main halo, that will be um, like halo zero. If we want to work with one of the satellites that will be in the halo, we can we can um, center on that. So for that, we, we use um, subfind, which basically tells us the information about all the halos. So the most massive halo will be halo zero. The next massive one will be halo one, halo two, halo three, etc. cetera. So, um, This is a loading subfind. And then um, we want to center, as I was saying, so after we've loaded subfind, we want to center the particles on the most massive subhalo, the main galaxy. So that's um, given by this zero here. You could change that and put another um, second most massive, third most massive, and so forth. But this will give you basically the main Milky Way like um, as it is now, it will just give you the main most massive Milky Way like galaxy in the simulation. Then you also want to remove the bulk velocity of the galaxy. So the, the velocities are zero at the center of the galaxy, because of course this is moving through the box. This galaxy is moving through the box the same way, you know, galaxies move through the universe, but you want to center it so that and remove the bulk velocity. And then we make a radial, once we've centered on the galaxy, we make a radial cut to select all the particles inside the virial radius. So we only want stuff inside the virial radius. 
Um, and then this step here is um, an important step. This step is um, we get the ages of the of the particles. And then you can now plot the um, if you once you have the ages, you can plot the star formation history. Um, for this uh, for this galaxy. So what you see here is you have the star formation rate. Um, this is the age. This is the start of the simulation. So big kind of big bang. This is redshift zero, and you see that this galaxy, for example, has a, a, a kind of much higher star formation in the early universe that declines towards redshift zero. Okay, has any group managed to get to this point? Yes? Yes? We got there. Okay, great. The competition is on. Okay. Okay, so, so far we've centered the particles on the galaxy, but we haven't aligned the disk to the coordinate system. So the Z component of the angular momentum axis um, will be just oriented al along some random di direction, and you can find that. You'll see that here. This is just um, plotting the um, like two projections of the particles of this galaxy, and you see that it's you can't see the galaxy face on. It's just in some random direction, and then this this package has an inbuilt function that will do the rotation for you. So if you keep going, it does the rotation for you, and now you can see that you see the galaxy. Um, face on and edge on here. You can see this nice little uh, bar here also, and this even has a little boxy peanut as well. The package also can, gives you a function to calculate the radius from the coordinates, but of course, you can also do that just from the coordinates as well. Um, and then you can plot um, the circular velocity of stars. So this is just by assuming the enclosed, assuming spherical symmetry and just getting the enclosed mass of the stars. So this is the circular, the contribution to the uh, rotation curve from the circular velocity of stars. And um, okay, now comes the first exercise. So um, the first exercise is to calculate a V circ for the circular velocity for stars and dark matter individually and together. So here there is a try it yourself to load the particle um, type one, so the high resolution dark matter, then apply the centering and the masks as above and calculate the radii of dark matter particles. So I would suggest try it yourself. Um, if you can't, I've given you here the solution. You can expand it and see the solution. Um, and then afterwards, in all the other exercises, um, I don't give you the solution. So the first one gives you the solution, the other ones you don't have the solution. So you can try and uh, try it yourself. So um, yeah, so you can basically copy, like you can see the kind of uh, code, what, what's done here to plot the um, circular velocity of stars. And then you can try and do this for the dark matter and then combine dark matter and stars together to get the total rotation curve. Okay, so whoever finishes this uh, little exercise uh, first of plotting the dark matter and the stars together to get the total circular velocity, give a shout. Ready, steady, go.
Okay, so has anyone been able to do exercise one? Ooh, okay, we've got two teams. Team Zeus at the back? No? Is it more a connection problem? You can you can have what you want. You can <laughs> okay, so for those who have, um, yeah, if you if you haven't been able to um, to do um, exercise one, so here is the. Uh, if you just click here, um, you'll see the code um, for the solution. So it shows you some of the differences from the previous one, how to load the dark matter instead of the stars. Um, but then it does the same thing. It centers on the halo. It cuts all the stuff that's so it only keeps the cut that's in um, a small region of the virial radius, so on and so forth. Okay. So if once you have this, you now have the, um, you have the circular velocity due to dark matter. You have the circular velocity due to the stars. So exercise two is now uh, add them together and plot the total circular velocity from stars and dark matter and also plot the stars and dark matter on the same plot so you can you can see those so you've done it already wow <laughs> team athena is flying oh, you did it too sorry sorry team hera is flying too Mm, I don't know, guys. Should it look like that? I'm not sure. Did Did you add it in quadrature? <laughs> so it's <laughs> so you want to add. Um, so to get the total, you need to add it in quadratures. So you need to get the square root v v star squared plus v dark matter squared. V star squared plus V dark matter squared, all of that square rooted, that will give you the total circular velocity. Thank you. 
Okay, so who has exercise two done? Yes. Team Hera, exercise two? No? Team. Uh, the dark matter and uh, stars, the total rotation curve. Yeah, you've got that? Ah, ages ago. Okay, great. <laughs> good, good. Okay, so Team Zeus, how are things going at the back? Getting there? Okay. All right, so just in the last um, few minutes before, before finishing. So um, in the next part, I basically just do some renaming of, um, of things. So, I, so, so selecting stars that are inside a small region of the virial radius, and then just renaming things into X, Y, and Z so you can work more comfortably with these later. Obviously, you have your own, everyone has their own way of working in Python. But just the last thing I wanted to mention is the abundances. Um, so, oh, this is from another workshop. Okay. Um, but yeah, this is um, one thing to keep in mind is that you, you can work with the abundances of these stars. So here's a little code snippet for loading the abundances and then, and then getting the abundance ratios. Um, for each of the stars. So once you do that, you should then be able to get, this is plotting now just, um, this is just the abundances of all stars inside 20 kpc. So it's just the MDF. So on the X axis, you have the, 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 the metallicity and then just the number of stars. So you see this, the shape of the MDF for this galaxy here. And you can also do something like plotting the alpha versus um, metallicity. So this is alpha over iron versus metallicity. This is again for all the stars inside 20 kpc. You see all these various structures. And you can also even um, keep going and do something like, let's color code by the age of stars. So this is now the alpha over Fe plane and the color bar is now the, um, the age of the star. So you can see how the average age in each pixel. So you can see how alpha rich stuff are more are older. And as you go to uh, more alpha poor and more metal rich, you also get younger stars. And then exercise three is to plot an age metallicity relation for this galaxy. So the ages. Um, so the metallicity is a function of age for the selection of stars. Um, and then, um, yeah, exercise four is to create face on an edge on projections of the galaxy in three age bins. So you separate into three different age bins. You can select whatever you want and just plot on the face on an edge on projection. Um, and then, well, let's see if we get to exercise four. But yeah, in the last few minutes, we have about five, 10 minutes, you can see if you can uh, try and do exercise three, for example, and yeah, let me know.
Okay, how is everyone getting along? Do we have exercise four? No, three, exercise three. Yes, Team Hera smashing it. Team Athens. <laughs> no, no. Team Zeus, how are we getting along back there? Okay. So I think let's, let's stop here, um, just so we can continue with the program. Um, congratulations, Team Hera, but you're all, of course, winners. Yes, well done, well done. Um, just to let you know, I've now put in the, um, Hera, in the Google Drive that you all have access to, I've now also put this, um, the full simulation tutorial. So there's a lot of other things in there as well that you can have a look at and see in your own time. Um, so do that in your own time. Okay. Many thanks, Francesca. Okay. I hope everybody will have enjoyed that. And uh, of course, uh, we're gonna continue with that uh, when back home. So we start uh, the regular um, flow of our okay. workshops. So Bog will be speaking now about the impact of magnetic fields uh, on the star forming ISM in simulated galaxies.
Test, test. Thank you very much. Is there a... And this is the laser? No? Ah, okay. Okay. Good go. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. So hi everyone. Um, I'm Kamran Bogue, um, but everyone knows me as Cami. And I just finished my PhD. I did my Viva literally two weeks ago um, <laughs> at the University of Manchester at the George Bank Center for Astrophysics, um, working with Rowan J. Smith. Um, on the impact of magnetic fields on star formation and by extension galaxy evolution. Um, thank you very much to the organizers for having me here. It's been a, a really wonderful week in, in Athens so far. So I'm very grateful and excited to be talking to you all about my research, the results from my thesis. So let's jump into it. I should give a short disclaimer, first of all, my simulations are somewhat smaller than a lot of the other simulations that people are doing here. I'm usually um, working with star formation um, researchers, so I'm always trying to convince them that you need to take into account this larger galaxy scale environment in order to understand star formation. I think here I'm going to need to persuade the <laughs> large simulation people that they need to take into account the star formation in order to understand what's going on with their galaxies. So, um, I'm going to start with my take home messages so that you can all immediately go to sleep and stop paying attention. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've color coded this here by the two different projects that I'm going to present. The first one in sort of green um, is the paper that we're hoping to publish very soon. And in this work, I ran two simulations that are essentially identical to each other in every way, apart from the fact that one has magnetic fields and one does not have magnetic fields. And then I basically play a very expensive game of spot the difference. Um, and when I play that game, I find that the MHD galaxy is more compact than its hydro counterpart. Um, it also has less evenly distributed star formation and less evenly distributed gas um, throughout its disk. And a suppressed star formation rate by a factor of about 1.6 compared to the hydro. Um, and there's this shift that we find in the Kennecott-Schmidt relation, which I'll talk about later, um, to higher gas surface densities in the MHD case. In the second project, which is in, uh, in sort of purple down here, um, I have a third simulation, which is another simulation with magnetic fields. But this one has um, some additional refinement scheme within it um, that allows us to get to higher resolutions and probe the alignment between the gas density gradient and the magnetic fields. Um, and we find, as other authors have found, that as you increase in number density of the gas, the gas becomes less and less aligned to the magnetic field. We also find that as you increase the magnetic field strength, that the alignment becomes stronger, which is somewhat intuitive, um, although that, that is true even at the same densities. So it's not just that magnetic field strength is increasing with increasing density. And we also find that alignment increases as you get to lower galactic radii, which is probably explained by the increasing magnetic field strength as you go towards the center of the galaxy. OK, let's take a step back and ask, um, why am I doing this? Which is a question that I ask myself often during my PhD. Um, and the key thing that you need to take away from this is that star formation and galaxy evolution are intrinsically linked. You can't understand one without understanding the other. They are a, a system that, that um, feed into each other. And this was shown by um, Rowan Smith and others in 2020 when they were looking at star formation in different uh, simulated galactic environments. So the idea essentially is that the interstellar environment in which stars are forming is very much affected by these larger scale galaxy um, processes. And in turn, the evolution of the galaxy itself is somewhat determined by the um, stellar population within it and the star formation history. Um, and to go a step further, for a complete understanding of either of those things, we cannot ignore magnetic fields as much as it would be nice if we could. Um, because magnetic fields are very challenging. 
Some of you probably already know this. There's somewhat of an infamous um, subject in, in astrophysics. And this is put very well by uh, Wodka in 1967. I'm going to uh, read you this quote, which I love. He says, the argument in the past has frequently been a process of elimination. One observed certain phenomena and one investigated what part of the phenomena could be explained. Then the unexplained part was taken to show the effects of the magnetic field. It is clear in this case that the larger one's ignorance, the stronger the magnetic field. <laughs> so clearly it's a, it's a difficult uh, thing to understand, right? Historically speaking. And there's good reason for this. Observing magnetic fields is really difficult. Um, it's not a, a simple thing to get good quality observations of and simulating them is not very easy either. With these difficulties, however, we have still managed to improve our understanding of magnetic fields a lot in the last few decades, especially. Um, we know that magnetic fields thread the ISM on all scales. We know that there's enough energy in the magnetic field for it to be dynamically important. Um, and if we take a look at this view of um, our own galaxy's magnetic field from 2000, and then if I, ah, oh, magic trick, now we can see the new, uh, even only 16 years later, we had this, this wonderful data from the Planck collaboration, which really gave us this unprecedented view into the um, magnetic field morphology of our own galaxy. So the goal of my work is to continue to improve our understanding of the impacts of magnetic fields and to understand what, what um, role they play in star formation and in the evolution of galaxy disks. Okay, so in order to understand my simulations, we're going to need to have some analysis tools. Um, and I'm going to explain two of them just briefly here. The first one is this Kennecott Schmidt relation that I mentioned earlier. This is a way for me to study the star formation statistically rather than looking at individual small clouds like some of my colleagues do. Um, and to put it just very simply, the KS relation basically tells you that as you increase the amount of gas available for star formation, how much does star formation actually increase? Um, so we'll come back to this later when it comes to my results. The second thing that I need to tell you guys about is this histogram of relative orientations analysis tool or HRO. Um, this was presented by Juan Soler and others in 2013. And essentially what this does is it takes your gas density, which is a scalar field and calculates the gradient of that gas density to get a vector field. And then you can compare that to the magnetic field, which is also a vector field to see how well they align. Um, and in their work, they found this sort of characteristic shift um, from uh, parallel orientations to mostly perpendicular orientations as you increase the um, gas uh, uh, number density. So we'll talk more about that later as well. Okay, so how am I going to do these simulations? We've already heard a little bit about the Arepo code, which is used for some larger scale cosmological simulations, although here I'm using it on a much smaller scale. And um, for me, this is solving the ideal MHD equations in 3D on this unstructured Voronoi mesh. And this mesh um, will refine adaptively depending on whether you're in a region with lots of dense gas where you need really high resolution or whether you're in a region with very diffuse gas that's not doing anything and you don't want to spend all your computing time there. Um, I'm using a slightly uh, edited version of the Arepo code with a bunch of custom modules for treatment of the cold ISM. Um, thank you, especially to the Arepo ISM collaboration because uh, they wrote a lot of this code. Um, so included physics here are self-gravity. We've got sink particles, which is how we model star formation. These are Crete over their lifetime as well. Um, I should note that these represent small clusters of stars, not individual stars, which uh, sometimes people don't realize. We have this wonderful time-dependent chemical network as well for our hydrogen chemistry and for our carbon monoxide. We actually don't reach the densities that you need for the carbon monoxide chemistry to converge. So we're just going to be looking at our ionized hydrogen, our atomic hydrogen, and our molecular hydrogen with this chemical network. And that's coupled um, with uh, this radiative heating and cooling um, wonderful thing that we have in our simulations, which allows us to track the thermal evolution of the gas. And that means that we end up with a really well-populated multi-phase interstellar medium, as you can see from this phase diagram from one of my simulations. We've also got supernova feedback, which is tied to the sink particles that I mentioned earlier. So um, supernovae are not just going off randomly or probabilistically, they're actually happening when and where we expect them to in the galaxy. Um, and of course, everything that we need for magnetic fields. So let's take an actual look at the simulations. Um, I should mention that we start from this uh, isolated M51-like initial condition from um, 
a collaborator of ours, Robin Tress. He did this wonderful paper in, in 2020 where he simulated an M51 light galaxy both with and without the Perturba, the companion. Um, and we take the case without the companion and get this sort of isolated flocculent galaxy um, and simulate it with and without magnetic fields, as I said. This is the sort of fiducial analysis snapshot at 150 mega years where we do a lot of our analysis. Um, but of course, one of the wonderful things about simulations is that you don't just have to look at one isolated snapshot. You can follow the evolution of um, structures over tens of millions of years. Um, and so now I get to show you all my wonderful GIFs here. <laughs> you can see the, the MHD case on the left and the hydro on the right. That's the um, column density for both. And then in the middle there, you're looking at the absolute magnetic field um, for the MHD case. There's obviously no magnetic field in the hydro case. And you can see how closely related the magnetic field and the um, gas column density are because we're doing ideal MHD. So that's no surprise. Okay, so there's two things that we can see right away here, which are, are very obvious. One is that the um, MHD case is much more compact, as I mentioned before. Um, if we actually compute the radial profile, we can see that the molecular gas in particular um, in the MHD has quite a steep drop off from about five kiloparsecs. Whereas in the HD case, that drop off is much more gradual and it's happening around seven and a half kiloparsecs. So big difference in the, in the radial extent. Um, and you can also see how much less evenly distributed the gas and the star formation is in the MHD case here. So the blue dots that you're seeing on these um, plots up here are the sink particles. Um, and they're much more clustered together in the MHD case, um, much less spread out. So that was interesting. Um, Another wonderful thing about simulations is that you can view them from any angle that you want. Um, so if we look at the edge on projections here, we can see that the MHD case has this um, sort of diffuse atomic envelope that extends above and below the galactic plane. You can also really see the difference in how steep the um, drop off in radial extent is from this from this edge on perspective. Um, and if we compute the, not the radial uh, profile now, but the profile above and below the galactic plane, we can see that indeed between about 0.5 um, kiloparsecs here and four kiloparsecs, um, the MHD galaxy has much more gas above and below the plane. Okay, now we get onto the star formation, which is um, of course very interesting. And this is the uh, star formation rate over the course of the simulation. I've grayed out the sort of zero to 100 um, mega year period here, um, which is where the galaxies are still responding to their initial conditions, this sort of initialization phase we don't do any analysis in. Um, and we see this suppression. The, the MHD star formation rate uh, stabilizes at about five solar masses per year, whereas in the HD case, this is more like 8.5 solar masses per year. You can see this starts to downturn because as an isolated galaxy, we don't have any gas inflow. So the uh, HD disk gets quite gas depleted after it's been doing this, this high amount of star formation. Um, so we don't trust anything sort of beyond 200 mega years either. Um, and this suppression of star formation rate has been seen in, in other works as well. There's a recent paper from Wibking and Krimholtz, um, which I also recommend you looking at. I've, I've shown a little screenshot from it here, where they say that they also see a suppression of, mag of um, star formation rate with magnetic fields by a factor of between 1.5 and 2. And if we look a little bit more in detail at this star formation rate difference, we can see that there's this shift in the kennicott schmidt relation when we compute it for both our models. So in the MHD case, you're requiring higher gas surface densities in order to achieve the same star formation rate surface densities. Um, the HD case here is shown in the red contours and the, the blue is the MHD. Um, so this could potentially help to give us some implication of how magnetic fields are suppressing um, star formation. What mechanism um, is that occurring by? And potentially the, the solution here is that magnetic fields are providing this additional pressure, right? Gravity wants to overcome these supportive forces in order for star formation to occur. Um, and so the bar at which gravity needs to exceed, the strength that it needs to, to summon in order to, to overcome these supportive forces is just higher in the MHD case. Um, so that could also be a reason why the um, star formation is less evenly distributed in the MHD galaxy. So there's only certain parts of the galaxy that will get to a high enough density in order for star formation to, to occur. Okay, let's move on to the second project now. Um, so this is the third simulation that I mentioned earlier. We don't have an HD counterpart for this one. We're just looking at one single MHD galaxy. Um, and here we're employing this additional genes refinement scheme, which makes sure that our genes length is always resolved by at least four cells. Um, and this gives us a, a slightly more realistic small scale ISM. Um, and it means that 
essentially all of our gas that is above number densities of about 100 um, per cubic centimeter is at subparsec resolution. So these are really high resolution SIMs. Um, we then conduct this HRO analysis that I was talking about earlier on this model um, in two kiloparsec by two kiloparsec by one kiloparsec regions, um, which I'll show in a moment. To give a little bit more detail about this HRO technique so that you guys can understand the results I'm about to show you, um, I've made this little sort of schematic uh, cartoon here on the, on the bottom left, showing you that when you have a sort of frowny face, that means that you're looking at parallel orientations. And then when you get the smiley face, that's uh, when the two are, are perpendicular to each other. Um, and rather than having to look at all of the different histograms that you might generate for all of the different density bins that you want to look at, um, Juan and, and others did this wonderful uh, parameterization of the shape of the histogram by looking at the area under the center and the area under the edges and then normalizing it. So you end up with a value uh, psi, which is between one and zero. A value of one tells you that the gas gradient and the magnetic fields are parallel to each other and uh, minus one tells you that they're perpendicular. So if we take one individual region of my galaxy, here you're seeing magnetic field um, streamlines in, in black arrows, um, and of course the, the gas density in red and orange. Um, what we find is when we look at uh, number density bins between one and 10 on the top here, and then 10 and 100, and then 100 to 800, as you look at denser and denser gas, that gas is less and less well aligned to the magnetic field. We don't see a full flip. We don't see a full uh, smiley face um, because we simply don't reach the densities high enough to be able to probe that regime. Um, Juan's simulations were much smaller than ours, so uh, he was able to get to higher, higher densities. Um, but our sink particles start to form above number densities of 800. I think it's specifically at number densities of 850. Um, so we don't want to look too close to that, uh, at which point gas is going to start being in sink particles and you're not going to get an accurate representation of the alignment of the gas to the magnetic field. So we're seeing a flattening of this histogram. It's telling us that um, gas is becoming less aligned to the magnetic field as its number density increases. This is the beautiful mosaic that I love so much of all of my different regions and the corresponding HRO result on the right hand side for all of those different regions. If I click this, I think, there you go, you can see all the different regions labeled. Um, one thing you'll probably notice right away is that in the corners here, you're getting these uh, um, results that don't really make any sense, especially in the, in the high uh, density bin, that, that purple sort of magenta bin there. Um, and that's because you simply just don't have enough gas cells in those corners where there's less dense gas. Um, so I look at the populations of the density bins that I've made um, to make sure that um, we have at least 10,000 cells in each of those uh, bins before we trust the results of the HRO analysis, which you'll see later when I change this into C values. Um, of course, as I said before, we have this wonderful chemical network, so we can look just at the atomic hydrogen or just at the molecular hydrogen, um, and indeed at the ionized hydrogen. So not only can we do this analysis for the total gas, but we can also do it just looking at the atomic gas or the molecular gas, right? So if I show you that same region that I just showed you a moment ago, but now in these different um, gas types, we can see the ionized hydrogen here, and then the molecular and then the atomic. Um, the ionized hydrogen, of course, we don't have enough of when it comes to these high densities. So there's only uh, a few um, hundred gas cells in even the lowest number density bin that we have here for ionized hydrogen. So we're gonna discard that from our future analysis. Um, and then when we look at molecular hydrogen and atomic hydrogen, we have, we have enough um, gas cells in those uh, chemical types in order to allow us to look at their values of psi. So let's look at them. Okay, so here's my galaxy once again. And then on the right, you're seeing all of the different regions and all of their psi values. So on the bottom, you've got number density. So as you go to the right, the number density gets higher for each of these individual uh, slices of my graph here. Um, and then psi values on the on the left and the dotted line is showing you zero so below that dotted line you're getting majority um, perpendicular orientations and above that dot dotted line you're getting majority parallel orientations and what we see is a few things one of which is that as you're going towards the center this psi value is getting higher right so gas is more aligned to the magnetic field in the center of the galaxy than it is at the edges that's one interesting thing um, the values generally seem to go diagonally downwards as you get to higher um, 
number density. So that's the result I, I told you about before. Gas is becoming less aligned to the magnetic field as you increase the number density. Um, there are some notable exceptions to this, though. The, the molecular hydrogen in particular, which is shown in green here, often seems to jump up at the highest density bin, meaning that it's going actually more aligned to the magnetic field when you compare the uh, 10 to 100 number density bin with the 100 to 800 number density bin. So um, that's a bit bizarre. I think this might be something to do with how uh, abundant the molecular hydrogen is. You're not going to really get much molecular hydrogen at these lower densities. And then as you start to get into the higher densities, it becomes much more common. So um, that's something that I'm going to be looking into very soon. Um, but one of the other things that we can do with these results is to look at the properties of those individual regions. So if we look at how much mass is in those individual regions or, or the median magnetic field strength in those regions, we can see how much the psi value, how much the alignment is changing depending on those parameters, right? So here we're looking at the median magnetic field strength of each of the regions. And we're seeing that as you increase the magnetic field strength, as you look at regions with higher and higher magnetic field strength, that psi value is increasing. So the gas is becoming more aligned to the magnetic field um, as you increase in uh, magnetic field strength. We can also, because we have this full galaxy, um, look at things in terms of the different galactic radii. So here I've categorized my different tiles in terms of the center, the sort of inner disk tiles and the outer disk tiles. The corners are not being included because the data is just not good enough in those corners. Um, and what you're seeing by this sort of color-coded graph I've got on the right here um, is that the center tile and indeed the, the inner disk tiles have higher C values than the outer um, tiles, which is telling you that gas is more aligned to the magnetic field as you go to lower galactic radii. Um, you're also seeing, of course, as you go to higher number densities, again, that that psi value is going down. So that, again, confirms um, what Juan Soler and others found. I wanted to mention here that the magnetic field strength is different in different regions independent of number density. So you may be familiar with the Crutcher relationship, which is telling you how much the magnetic field strength tends to increase as you go to higher number densities. Um, but the result I'm seeing here with higher magnetic field strengths is not just because there's more dense gas as you go towards the center. Um, so if we look at our, our different number density bins that we're probing here, um, we can see that within each of those bins, if you look at an inner region or an inner disk region versus an outer disk region, um, there is systematically lower magnetic field strengths in those outer regions, even for the same densities. OK, so with that, I can go on to my conclusions here. Um, as I said at the beginning, when I compared my HD and MHD galaxy, which are identical to each other, apart from the inclusion of magnetic fields, I found that the MHD galaxy was more compact and that it had less evenly distributed gas and star formation. It also had a consistently lower star formation rate, which has been seen by other authors as well. Um, and there's this characteristic shift in the kennecott schmidt relation, which is sort of the headline result from this, from this paper, um, with the MHD being shifted to higher gas surface densities for the same star formation rate surface densities. In the third model that I showed you, which is slightly higher resolution, we looked at the alignment between the gas density gradient and the magnetic field, and we see that they become less and less parallel to each other as you go to higher number densities. And we also showed that the alignment seems to increase with higher magnetic field strength, even when you're controlling for the density of the gas um, and at lower galactic radii also. But that is all. Please do check out my website where I will be um, putting all of these results and links to my papers and all those wonderful gifts that you saw in case you want to see them again. Thank you very much for listening and I'll happily take any questions. Thank you very much. Very interesting stuff. Uh, questions? Thank you for the talk. Uh, I was wondering on the very first example that you showed with uh, MHD versus HD, the MHD galaxy tend to form kind of a ring uh, in terms of the, the over density of gas. Uh, do you see, because you said like in general it's uh, uh, less evenly distributed, but uh -huh. do you see like structure forming more often uh, when you add magnetic field? Like, could you say like the number of rings or bar that are formed uh, could be higher uh, when taking into account magnetic field or when you have higher magnetic field within the galaxy? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we haven't, I guess, looked specifically at structure formation in the, in the MHD or the HD case. 
to look for more filaments or or, or bars or, or or any of those features that you talk about. Obviously, we're, we're running for quite a, a short period of time in a cosmological scale sense. So um, the original goal of simulating a, a disk that was this large was just to get a realistic environment in which we could look at star formation. It wasn't so much to look at um, differences in the galaxy structures as you, as you either included or, or didn't include magnetic fields, but it's certainly something that I'd like to do, um, maybe by running for a little bit longer. Um, the MHD case does tend to get higher peak surface density values than the, than the HD because it's more concentrated. Um, but even just looking at the two morphologically, I, I don't know if I could say for sure whether there's a big difference in the, in the structure that forms. I mean, obviously the, the HD galaxy tends to be a bit more bubbly. The, the, the um, supernovae and, and other feedback processes make this um, very bubbly substructure that we just don't see in the MHD case. Um, but I think maybe I'd need to run for longer to really be able to make conclusions about that. Yeah. Thank you for a very nice talk. Thanks. Um, you showed the latest map now for the magnetic fields from the Milky Way from the Planck mission in oh, 2016. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it is planned to have like any updated by map from another mission or the same mission anytime soon. Yeah, it's a good question. I, uh, as someone who um, does a lot of simulations, I have a tragically uh, poor <laughs> understanding of magnetic field observations. Um, so this is something that I'm still learning more about uh, now. Um, we had a really wonderful um, observatory called Sophia. I don't know if you heard about it. It was this sort of plane that didn't even go uh, into space, but just had this big telescope stuck out the side of it that was giving us really high quality polarization data, which was giving us um, some really nice magnetic field data. Unfortunately, Sophia um, was canceled um, or, or was grounded for, for some reason or another. I think it just didn't have funding to continue, even though it was producing really great science. Um, so there's still people now working on the Sophia data that was taken in that period of time. Um, but people are also interested in extra galactic magnetic fields now, right? Not just the, our own galaxies, magnetic field morphology. So um, I think the Sophia data is probably the best quality stuff that we have at the moment. And I don't think there's anything planned yet that will get us higher quality stuff than that. There, there is a um, JCMT is also taking some, some polarization data and extra galactic on extra galactic sources as well that I think is, is also useful, but it's still not the quality that the Sophia was as far as I'm aware. Sorry, any JCMT people if you're here. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. More questions? I have a question. Wait, the slides before you showed. I had a question on the, there seems to be a threshold in low temperature around 12 Kelvin. A threshold, say that again? A, a threshold of lowest temperature. Of lowest? Yes. Apple. What temperature? Uh -huh. Why? Oh, in the, what, in the um, what happens in the code? Yes, yes, yes. So at, at 20 Kelvin, we set a temperature floor. We, we artificially say we're not allowing any um, gas to go temperatures below this value. That's um, because there is some artificial issue in Arepo that means that if you allow gas to cool to a certain extent, um, Someone was talking to me about this last week. There's some there's some problem that, that arises if gas cools within I think less than 10 Kelvin. Then uh, there's this sort of cascade effect that happens in a repo. It's something to do with the way that we're implementing our cooling functions. Um, and I think I think a, a a fix for that bug is being worked on at the moment. But in the meantime, we just don't look at any gas that is below temperatures of 20 Kelvin. Could, um, it, could it have uh, an influence? You know, I mean, probably in the um, outer region of, of galaxies because its temperature is, is dropping. Will be lower, yeah. Uh, I think, I mean, for the most part, the really, really cold gas is the really, really dense gas, which is the kind of stuff that we're not really able to, to reach with our simulations anyway, because we're doing things on a slightly larger scale. So I don't, I, I don't imagine that we're going to see any... Um, extreme differences if we if we allowed gas to cool below 20 kelvin in the um in in images like like this one um but we i'd only know for sure once the the it's fix still a has huge been... uh, difference in physically speaking down to say the cmp temperature yeah but that is, it's happening on small scales right in terms of the the places that we would be 
um, seeing it in these simulations. So, but yeah, it's a it's a great point. I mean, it's definitely something we're going to want to um, implement as soon as it's ready. Yeah. Any other question? Very nice talk. Uh, I Thanks. think, yeah, in the past, there was always someone in the audience asking, what about magnetic field? Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, I guess the next question now is, what about cosmic rays? Uh, yes. I don't know if you have anything to say about it, but if you do, great. Otherwise, what's, what's the next steps? Yes, yeah. so um, Philip Gerahidis in Heidelberg is doing a lot of work with simulations of this sort of scale, I think also with a repo, um, and has been looking at the effects of cosmic rays for a long time. And um, the, the trade-off with these simulations is just that you want to keep including as many things as you can, but the more things you try to put in, the slower the simulation gets, and eventually it stops being feasible, right? We, we have a prescription in these simulations for early stellar feedback, not just um, supernovae, but photoionization and, and all of those things. And we, we just can't include it in the simulations that we run because it makes the code too slow. Um, and cosmic rays are another thing that has been implemented in a repo now and and theoretically we could include in our simulations but because we're trying to do this work with magnetic fields um and to have sync particles that are are reasonably well resolved um it means that the cosmic rays are, are are not feasible for us at the moment there is some work to um improve the parallelization in a repo i think specifically in the sync particle routines um which are currently our, our biggest issue in terms of slowdown and once that's been piped through then it will be possible quite possibly to include cosmic rays and um philip Girahidis has been encouraging us for a long time to to start including them um but it, the papers that he's published both recently and, and even I think like 12 years ago or something, he had a great paper on this. Um, so uh, yeah, that gives us almost everything we need to know about what effect cosmic rays would be having because the, their simulations are so similar to ours. Um, but I'd love to include them. Yeah, that will, that will be next. One thing at a time. <laughs> Thanks. So let's thank the speaker again. Now we have a, a coffee break. Uh, just make sure that the speakers of the next session have arranged everything with their presentation with the technicians over there. So we come back in a little bit less than half an hour. Thanks. Uh, I mean, when, when the JWS, we've had, we've had this sort of bubble of subculture in our simulations for a long time. And when the JWS team yeah. just came out, there was one, uh, I forget exactly which galaxy it is now, but it's, I mean, I'll show you the image. It is super, super bubbling. Like the, the fact that our simulations have been predicting this was um, very encouraging. Really was the encouraging. So we start again, please take your seat. There is a small change in the program. Actually, we have an Elise uh, talk right now and I'll meet us uh, later. So now we will be listening to Annelise Odibert's talk, feedback from low power radio jets on the gas reservoirs of waste. Thank you, Panos, and thank all the organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity to present my work here today. Uh, my name is Annelise Audibert. I'm a postdoc at the IEC in the beautiful Isle of uh, Tenerife in the Canary Islands. And I'm going to be an alien uh, in this conference because I think I'm the first one to talk about AGNs. So uh, let me first introduce a little bit. Um, so now uh, we understand that AGNs are not orbit objects, but rather uh, episodes in a galaxy life. So because they have such a short phase activities that can go as little as 0.1 mega years, we believe a galaxy can go through several AGN uh, episodes in the lifetime. Can you hear fine? Uh, it depends on the gas supply for this galaxy. So how do we actually feed an AGN or a black hole? So um, in order to do this, uh, to test this, we have to look at different scales. So at 10 kiloparsec scales, we believe that mergers 
uh, and galaxy interactions are the main uh, uh, way of uh, triggering AGN. And this happens mostly for more, more luminous AGN. I'm sorry. For uh, kiloparsec scales, we heard all this week about bar instabilities that they are able to produce uh, uh, um, uh, to, to, uh, the bar instabilities that can be driven, uh, driven by secular evolution or by uh, interactions. They can uh, create a ring, a nuclear ring, and this ring will be a starburst ring and it's going to concentrate gas uh, in, in the center of uh, in the kiloparsec scale of the galaxies. At few hundred uh, uh, parsec scales, if you go a little bit closer to the nucleus, we need some additional mechanisms like nested and kinematical decoupled bars uh, and nuclear spires that are able to drive and funnel the gas towards the center. But if we go even closer to the black hole at 10 parsec scales, we need a, a um, cascade of uh, instabilities and uh, like M equal two or M equal one that is going to provide the formation of a thick disk uh, similar to a torus that we actually observe in galaxies. And, but I am interested mostly on the response of the activity in the galaxy. So once the black hole is active and is a critical matter, it's going to eject wings and jets that can, lead to, can hit the gas around and prevent the formation of new stars. And eventually with the lack of fuel for star formation, it can eventually quench uh, the black hole activity as well. And this is known as uh, AGN feedback and is uh, believed to regulate galaxy growth. So actually here I show uh, um, a sketch that shows in the blue line, the observations, the uh, observation of galaxies in the universe. So the massive galaxies, and here the, the, we have the uh, simulations without including uh, feedback recipes. And we see that the simulations cannot match uh, the observations. We need to include AGN feedback to explain this bright end. Otherwise, without AGN feedback, galaxies will grow too big and too massive. And nowadays, from the observational point of view, we know that outflows are ubiquitous, at least in the most luminous AGNs. But they are observed in multi-phase, like, uh, I mean, uh, we can observe uh, say, uh, tracing several lines, atomic lines, molecular lines, ionized lines using different facilities, but they are also multi-scale phenomena. So here I show from the accretion disk scales, like these uh, winds launch at very close to the black hole, to the ISM of galaxy, and then to the traditional uh, uh, radio lobes that are acting in the circumgalactic medium. And there are two main modes for uh, radiation uh, uh, feedback. The quasar mode that is happening uh, in uh, through radi radiative process, like a wind launch in the accretion disk. And this happens in high luminosity agents that are accreting matter close to the adding to luminosity, and mostly in high Z and uh, young quasars. On the other hand, we have the radio mode, that also known as kinetic mode, that is happening to the uh, launch of uh, collimated radio jets. So this is happening mostly in low luminosity agents at low Z and massive host galaxies. And this mode of agent is usually associated with the large scale uh, lobes that are preventing the cooling flows in the galaxy clusters. And uh, from the observations, we can observe molecular uh, gas outflowing in different phases. So here there is a compilation of observational properties that we can measure, like here is the, AG, uh, the bolometric uh, uh, AGN luminosity, and here is the mass outflow rate traced by molecular winds in blue and ionized winds in blue. And we can uh, see two clear trends in this plot. First, there is a correlation between the mass outflow rate and the AGN luminosity. So this goes with the idea that the AGN drives a wind that pushes the gas away. And from uh, uh, simulations, we know that this is about, the energy of the outflow is about 5% of the, uh, the AGN luminosity. But another, another thing that we can see that is an offset between the ionized uh, wings and the molecular ones. So this might indicate that the molecular phase is actually tracing the bulk of the outflowing uh, mass budget. So uh, this plot also gives us the impression that this only the quasar mode uh, uh, um, feedback that is happening because it's only correlating with the bolometric luminosity of the agent, but we are going to discuss this later. So I'll separate my uh, results into parts. First was uh, feeding and feedback in nuclei of galaxies or NUGA that I studied during my PhD. So these were very nearby and low luminosity agent 
that uh, are hosting bar galaxies. And the second part will be the gas hazard bar of massive and uh, luminous quasars, part of the KSO feed project that I, I, I work in Tenerife. So in my PhD, we resolved the nuclei of, of galaxies with ALMA. So we wanted to perform the morphology and kinematics of the molecular gas disk in the central kiloparsecs uh, in nearby bar, bar uh, low luminosity agents. So we studied seven uh, galaxies. Uh, they were cipheral liners or uh, star forming uh, galaxies with different bar strengths. And here, I think we show, uh, we saw, we've seen this, uh, some of these galaxies during the, this conference. Uh, and in the optical images, we can see that this, uh, these galaxies have uh, nuclear rings that are the spots of young star formation. And with the ALMA observations, tracing the molecular phase with a superb resolution of only a few parsecs, we started to review, like this is the intensity in the top panels and the velocity on the bottom. We started to review that the molecular gas is also concentrated along rings. So all the galaxies are uh, concentrated along the rings. And another interesting thing is that these rings, these nuclear rings uh, that have sizes of few hundreds of uh, parsecs uh, scales, they correspond to the ILR or the inner ILR of the bar potential. And so this is a conclusion that the main, uh, the main bar of these galaxies are efficiently driving and piling up this, this gas in the spots of uh, uh, young star formation. But we need an additional mechanism to bring the gas towards the center because these are aging and we need to fuel them. So we found a nuclear uh, trailing spiral. So the, for three galaxies in the sample, we found this, the, uh, here is the star forming ring. And then in the center with scales of 100 parsec, we find very contrasted uh, spiral structures. And they are even uh, um, more clear evident in the dense gas tracer. So, uh, yesterday, I think Mattia was mentioning that uh, usually we see low uh, density structures inside the nuclear ring, but we see a very contrast uh, structure, even for another galaxy here, NGC 613. So this, uh, in all these galaxies have uh, nuclear bars. So we believe that the nuclear bar is acting to form the, 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 the nuclear spiles. And when we compute the gravitational torques of the, uh, of the, of the gas, uh, on the gas, on, uh, um, on the stellar potential to, to, to the gas, we can derive some ages. So we, we derive that uh, these the spirals are fueling the, the, uh, the supermassive black holes in time scales of only a few tens of mega years. We can also uh, do some kinematical model. So here I'm trying to model rotation and then to to see what is not rotating, what is part of the outflow. And we see that uh, in some cases we, have, we can have both uh, uh, inflowing of gas and outflow of gas traced by, uh, for example, the blue wings in the nuclear spectrum here, or we have an example of uh, a star bus driven wind in NGC 1818, uh, 08, sorry. And uh, the main conclusion here is that even with the small uh, number of galaxies and for these low luminosity agents, we follow the relation of higher the bolometric luminosity or the radio power, higher the uh, molecular, molecular outflows. So I had to go briefly through this part because now I'm going to move to more extreme AGNs that are quasars. So this is um, the goal of this, pro uh, of this project it will, is to assess the impact of quasar driven wings on the, ga the galaxy properties. So we have a sample of obscure uh, quasars, so type two quasars, and they are really bright with luminosities of 10 to the uh, uh, 46 cells per second. And uh, they are at redshift uh, 0.1 or more or less 500 mega years, uh, uh, mega parsec, sorry. And uh, all of them, they have uh, uh, radio access. So it means that the, to explain the radio emission in these galaxies, we need something that is not only coming from star formation but they are not radio loud. They are not the typical radio galaxies. And we think that these winds and jets could be potential drivers of multi-phase outflows in these galaxies. So we have a, sem uh, a sample of 48 uh, quasars, and we want to characterize the age and feedback on these quasars. And to do so, we are gathering uh, a lot of observation from different facilities. So here I show some, some of them, but in this talk, I will focus on the ALMA observations because I'm working with the molecular gas because the molecular gas is the fuel both to 
form new stars and also to feed the black holes. So here I present the work that we observed seven um, quasars with ALMA uh, with a resolution of more or less 400 parsecs in, this, in these targets. So first is that two galaxies were not detected because they were red early type uh, galaxies. But the other five we detected and we see a variety of morphologies. So we have a centrally concentrated um, CO emission here, uh, double peak morphology in other two cases. And two cases we see the, clearly the spiral arms and even the bar uh, shape. So we wanted to test now if these uh, are really rotating these molecular uh, disks. So as uh, Dimitri showed in his talk, we did the, uh, the velocity over the velocity dispersion profiles. I don't know if you can see the, the, the dotted uh, lines here that delimitate the, when this ratio is one. So we see that most of the galaxies are dominated by rotation. So are well described by rotation, except one that is a mess. And, but I, as I, I told you, I was interested to see non-rotating uh, gas pattern. So I was interested to, to probe the molecular outflows. So we detect molecular outflows for the all six galaxies that I show, and they present, we, these are bright quasars. So if you remember this plot that was correlating the mass outflow rate with the bolometric luminosity, this is the correlation found in the literature. And our points here in purple are much lower than the, the ones expected. So for this luminosity of 10 to the 46, we expect to detect very massive molecular outflows, but we don't see it. They are very mild with mild velocities and outflow rates in this range from five to 100. And they have properties between Cipher galaxies that are low luminosity and the most powerful ones that are the Eulers. And since we are starting to populate this um, region, we might question that maybe AGN luminosity or bolometric luminosity is not the only uh, factor driving outflows. So maybe there are other factors such as the jet power, the coupling between these winds and jets in, in, with the disk might be playing a role. So to study this, we did the additional test that is to perform. Here is the energy, the kinetic energy of the outflow in, in the y-axis. And here we tested with the bolometric luminosity and the ratio of the kinetic power of the outflow with the luminos bolometric luminosity uh, is a way to trace the coupling efficient between these outflows and the uh, source of energy. In this case, we see that this, this part of the plot is very scattered and we have coupling efficiencies very low in order 10 to the minus six. And these coupling efficiencies are much, much less than the ones predicted by cosmological simulations that include the gen feedback in the quasar mode uh, regime. But on the other hand, if we look at the jet power instead of the bolometric luminosity, we see that it's uh, still scattered, but there might be a correlation. And the coupling efficiency between the kinetic energy of the outflows and the jet powers is to the order of 10 to the minus three. And this is in prediction with the simulations of, uh, radio, of radio mode simulations uh, uh, in, in the literature. So we are starting to believe that even in this highly accreting system that should be dominated by the quasar mode of feedback, we believe that these low jet powers might be the dominant feedback me mechanisms. And this is in agreement with other results from the literature. But I'm going to uh, showcase one specific example that is the case of the teacup agent. Why teacup? Because I don't know if you can see clearly here in this image, but it has like this, uh, bubble shape that resembles the handle of a teacup, seeing that in the large scale. But we were looking at the center, and in the center it has a compact radio jet of kiloparsec scales that I show here in the contours, that we believe they have a very small angle with the CO disk, the molecular disk. So I analyze uh, CO2 to one and archival CO3 to two observations, so I show them here. And we see that the double peak morphology is kind of correlated with the jet direction. So it seems that the jet or a wing is pushing away the gas in the center and make creating this uh, double peak morphology. So when we were doing the kinematical modeling using the 3D Barolo, that is a tool to de derive ve um, the velocity curves of the galaxies. So here is the uh, velocity field and um, in the middle is the model and the residuals. We see that we have a, a a lot of residuals along this direction. 
And actually rotation in this galaxy accounts for 55% of the, the flux. So for high velocity gas, the rotation is not able to be explained. And since we had two lines, we could do especially resolve line ratio. So this is uh, what I plot, plot here. Um, uh, a line ratio might, might trace difference in the gas conditions, in temperatures or in excitation. So we see an enhancement of this line ratio along this direction that is perpendicular to the jet and is much higher than the values found in typical galaxy disks. And this might say that the gas in these regions have different gas excitation. And we believe that this hot gas that is part of a cocoon of shock, of shock, uh, shock gas. But on the other panel, I show the velocity dispersion and we see that the velocity dispersion is also perpendicular to the radio uh, jet direction. And this phenomena, uh, it was already observed using news observations in the optical for some jetted cipher galaxies and also for some radio galaxies that they see the velocity dispersion also perpendicular to the um, jet orientation. But this is the first time we find clear evidence of enhancement in velocity dispersion and also in gas excitation in the molecular phase. So we believe that the jet here is playing an important role. And I will do a parenthesis because in the introduction I mentioned that radio mode is usually associated with the large scale radio jets. But I wanted to say, uh, say about radio mode feedback in galactic scales acting actually on the ISM. So there are hydrodynamical simulations of relativistic jets, jets piercing a galaxy disk, a gas rich galaxy. And as the jet percolates to the galaxy disk, here I can, we can see different snapshots for the evolution of the, uh, of the jet. And we can see that as it percolates, it creates a cocoon of shock material that is able to drive multi-phase outflows. And the feedback from these jets depend on the kinetic energy and also uh, in the clumpy distribution of the gas. But one interesting result from the simulations is that we can have strong feedback even from low power jets. So one may think a very high uh, powerful jet will be able to create more damage in the galaxy, but this is not what we see from the observations. Uh, here we have the same gas conditions, initial gas conditions, and a simulation from a low jet power and a high jet power. And we can see that for a shorter time, the high jet power is able to escape the galaxy easily. On the other hand, the low jet power is trapped into the galaxy potential for longer times and creating more damage over larger volumes. And one the, also another result from the simulation is that uh, also the coupling between the ISM and the jet inclination. So for a jet inside the galaxy percolating within the galaxy plane, it will create more damage than a jet Per perpendicular to the galaxy plane. So we thought that this might explain what we observe for the ticker. So we contact the simulator. So we run simulation E of Mooker G and using the uh, prescription uh, uh, describing Menakshi to reproduce the observed features of the gas. So we mimic what will be the behavior of the molecular gas. So here on the right uh, panels, I see the observations. So this large scale image uh, showing the ionized gas and we can see that it correlates pretty well with the simulation of the hot tenuous gas. And in the center, we have the ALMA observations that show also this high velocity dispersion. And here we can see the simulated velocity dispersion and it matches pretty well. The simulations are also able to predict this enhancement of turbulence or outflows in this direction. So one thing that we learn from the simulations is as the jet propagates to the uh, ISM, it's going to get uh, split and deflected multiple times. And it's going to carry momentum in all the directions, including the direction perpendicular, not only along the jet uh, propagation. And this will be able to leave gas and create outflows even in, to perpendicular to the ga galaxy plane. So, but I just wanted to keep in mind that these uh, velocities that we observe are less than the escape velocity of the galaxy. So this molecular outflow eventually will ring back to the galaxy as part of our galactic fountain. So it's now acting uh, to redistribute the gas and the material and the metals in the galaxy and possibly delaying star formation. So we have some uh, observations going on in Tenerife with ALMA, VLA, JWST and uh, also in the optical with KCWI in Hawaii uh, to do different projects and all of them are related to multi-phase uh, 
observations of AGN feedback in this crisis. So if you're interested to work with this kind of science, AGN and uh, uh, observations, please come to talk to me or send me an email because we have some opportunities for PhD students and postdocs. So uh, if you're interested, uh, let me know. And this is my takeaway uh, message. So we find that even uh, though the AGN feedback in this very powerful galaxy is not depleting the molecular gas, we see molecular gas there, but they are doing something. They are actually, uh, we find evidence that these low power jets or wings are disturbing the morphology or the kinematics of the stars in the central kiloparsis of this galaxy. So we are witnessing the uh, AGN feedback on the current AGN episode of these galaxies. So stay tuned because we have a lot of data uh, coming up and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. So questions, please. Yeah, thank you so much. <coughs> <It's, coughs> sorry, no, very interesting. Uh, about this tear cup case, uh, can we actually estimate the cone of the cone angle of the jets, or is it included in the simulation as a uh, like? We we could derive from the observation the inclination yeah. of the jets related to us, and also from the kinematical modeling, we could derive the inclination of the molecular disk. And then with this, we could see that they are almost coplanar. That's why we were seeing a lot of feedback in this galaxy, a lot of outflows, like strong outflows, because the jet is almost coplanar. But this we derive from the observations, and then we tailor the simulations to have the same kind of geometry that we observe. Mm -hmm, but not, not the direction of the jet, but how broad the like, cone size. This, this is defined by the resolution of the observation. So there is probably this is a more collimated jet, but due to the beam dilution of the observations, like the, res the spatial resolution, you spread it, but it seems to be elongated, it seems to be a jet like morphology. And we believe it's a jet because we also have the spectral index maps that shows that this has a very steep uh, continuum. So probably it's related to a jet, yeah, okay. even so though it doesn't like uh, as a, the traditional jets. <laughs> Okay, uh, who was not here? Thank you for the talk. Uh, you mentioned that uh, there was some jets within the plane of the disk and they were more effective. Uh, so I have two questions like, is it random the orientation or are there like more frequent cases in terms of uh, within the plane or perpendicular? And do you have an estimation of how much of the total gas reservoir is affected depending on this inclination of the jet? So for the first question, there are some other observational uh, cases that the jet is coplanar. So one famous case is IC5063 that was observed in, with ALMA, with James Webb, with several uh, telescopes. And we see that the jet is coplanar and is driving also an outflow, but it's driving in the direction of the, the the jet propagation. And for the second question, what, what was it, sorry? Do you have an estimation of, depending on how inclined is your jet, yeah, which so a fraction of the total gas reservoir is uh, mm, Not really a fraction, but how to reproduce certain observed properties. So there is this paper from Minakshi. Let me see if I go back, if you want to take the reference. So Minakshi, she analyzed the simulation. So she ran this simulation and she tried to test with different inclinations related to the disk and also different kinetic powers of the jet. So they have a set of uh, inclinations, possible inclinations, and we see that the stronger feedback comes when the, the jet is almost to the plane of the galaxy. And when it's perpendicular, it's almost doing nothing. Very nice data. And so, when you see the velocity dispersion increase in, in perpendicular direction from the jet, is this in the both molecular gas and uh, ionized gas? Yes, I had to cut the ionized gas phase because I thought that we run out of time, but I can show you. Yeah, we see for the same target, we see either with MUSE or with the Megara in the Tenerife, in La Palma Island, we see both trends, but these are much larger scale, but it seems to be perpendicular in the same direction that we see the molecular uh, dispersion. 
the ionized dispersion is also, but in much larger scale. Okay, and if you do kind, kind of a BPT diagram, what does it, what does the ionized guys guess say? It's, uh, I think they, they with the MUSE data, they did uh, the resolve uh, BPTs. And also for the paper uh, of CIFR uh, jetted galaxies from using MUSE observations, they did the resolve BPTs, mm -hmm. and they find that this direction that is perpendicular is mostly dominated by shocks. Okay, okay thanks. So it's like two results uh, together, you know, like a combination. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the talk. So might be a very naive question, but uh, we know that there are relations that are supposed to be caused by feedback between like the mass of the black hole, the mass of the bulge or the velocity dispersion. Is there any way that you can see if your sample is consistent with those relations or is offset because maybe the, the feedback I, mechanism? I haven't tried to check the, if you fit the scaling relations, but probably yes. But the question is that in order to spot feedback, it's very difficult because of the questions of time scales. Maybe the galaxy was active in the past and we're seeing the outflow from a previous uh, activity phase. So in this case, we try to match the dynamical uh, time scales of the outflows with the, uh, um, the, the time scale for AGN activity. So we might, be, we might we think that these outflows are related with the current AGN episodes, but it's, um, it's tricky. Uh, but in the scaling relations, the typical ones like the black hole mass over the sigma, probably they fall in the, in the scaling relations. Like there will be normal age, uh, no, normal galaxies in the plane. Thank you. Well, so if not, thank you again. Please, and then we proceed to the next speaker. George in the Magellan clouds. That's portable, no. Yeah, that one. Perfect. Great. So thanks very much for having me at this excellent conference. I'm Lara. I'm a postdoc at the AIP. And today I'm going to bring you back down from the very large scales of the previous talk, uh, in terms of distance at least, to something a lot more local, um, the Magellanic Clouds, and in particular the LMC, what we know so far about some of the structures in its disk, and then some upcoming observations that are going to give us a lot more detail on how those structures have formed. So Oscar already gave you a little bit of an introduction as to why you should care about the LMC as a disk galaxy, but that was on Tuesday several talks ago. And so I'll just go over this briefly again. One thing that's important is the LMC is about a factor of 10 less massive than the Milky Way. And so it's actually interesting to study the different structure formation mechanisms that we normally see in these very big galaxies like the Milky Way or even larger in something that's really like an intermediate mass regime. In addition, the LMC is an actively interacting system. We know that not only is it probably on its first infall to the Milky Way potential, it's probably also been interacting with its companion, the SMC, for the past several giga years. And though, unfortunately, we don't have a really good idea of what that interaction history with the SMC is in terms of details. One thing we do know is the most recent interaction between these two galaxies, and that was a pericentric passage of the SMC around the LMC about 150 million years ago. And so what we'd like to do really is to understand what effects that pericentric passage and even the earlier ones have had on the LMC's disk. Now, we already know a little bit about this in terms of just looking at the structures in the LMC. And I'll take you through some of that now. 
One thing we know is that the structures we see in the disk are really dependent on what stellar population you're looking at. If you focus on these three plots on the right, these are density maps for three different age stellar populations in the LMC, and they all have really different morphologies. If we look at the youngest stellar population, the supergiants, you see the LMC's bar shows up really clearly. If we then look at slightly older main sequence populations, these are actually mostly concentrated at the two ends of the bar and in the LMC's single dominant spiral arm. And then if we look at the oldest ones, the RGB stars, these form a very extended elliptical distribution. Actually, another thing that's worth pointing out that varies with the tracer population is something as basic as that where is the center of the LMC? Because here on the left, I'm showing you a recent summary map. And it turns out that depending on both what technique you use and what population you look at, you actually get very different answers. If you're looking at say a photometric center or one of several different stellar populations up here, or maybe even the H1 gas. And these are enormous offsets, degrees on the sky, which are very large physical scales. And so that's really something we'd like to pin down better. In addition to actually the, the structure changing with the population, another thing that changes is the kinematics. This slide is full of radio, uh, rotation velocities for the LMC, and these also vary a lot. If you focus first on the right, these are rotation curves for several different stellar populations in the LMC. And you can see that the older stellar populations typically rotate slower than the younger populations. Now that we can mostly explain as just being asymmetric drift, that is because the older populations are kinematically hotter when we measure this just as a methyl velocity as is, um, that appears to be slower even though nominally all of these populations should have the same total circular velocity given that they're orbiting in the same potential. Um, but even with asymmetric drift, it doesn't explain just the degree of bumpiness that we see in some of these rotation curves. In addition, even if we just look at a single stellar population, in this case on the left, these are just old RGB stars, you actually get an enormous variation in both what you calculate as the rise of the rotation curve and what you define as like the flat velocity, depending on both where you're looking in the disk and whether you're using say proper motions or line of sight velocities or some combination of both. Finally, as well as these differences, we also know just the underlying structure of the LMC is, of its disk is completely messed up. Um, the LMC we know is inclined. And so in this plot, what this line here is showing you is the line of nodes, which describes how the LMC's inclined disk plane intersects with the plane of the sky. And as you can see, this actually twists really significantly once you get out past around six degrees. And that's not just a projection effect because the LMC is large on the sky, it's actually an underlying change in the disk properties. And we know that the LMC's disk is warped. In this plot, if the LMC's disk were perfectly flat, it would exactly follow this red line. Obviously that's not the case. You can see that there are some bumps, which are indications of warps. And although you can't see it here, we also know that the LMC's bar is inclined relative to the underlying disk plane. And you can also see if we move towards the southwest, this is in the direction of the SMC, the scale height increases a lot with radius. The distance here, which is sort of describing the height of the disk is a lot smaller than it is over here. And so obviously this is telling us that the LMC has been really messed up by all its interactions with both the Milky Way and the SMC. But unfortunately, so far we've had a really difficult time trying to link any specific interaction to any one of these specific features. And this is probably at least partially because of the data of a lack of models, and also just because these structures are all in the central LMC. And we might have better luck if we instead move to the outskirts. There's a couple of reasons for that, but the most important is the fact that in the outskirts, the dynamical timescales are just a lot longer than in the central regions. And so in the central regions, where if you have these things phase mixing a lot more quickly, it's a lot harder to actually trace any individual interaction when they've been affected by multiple of them and they've not relax back to equilibrium afterwards. Um, so it's a lot harder. But it's only actually been very recently that we've been able to trace the outskirts of the LMC and that's thanks to Gaia. It turns out that even if we just do a very simple proper motion selection here uh, in this central panel, we can pretty easily identify the older populations, the red pumps and the red giant branch stars out to enormous distances from the clouds. If we make a density map with those selected stars, you get something like this plot on the right and you can just see that there is a ton of structure once you get out to eight, 10, 12 more degrees from the LMC and the SMC. 
in particular. There's some long arm-like features maybe, both at the north of the LMC and extending out from the south of the SMC. There's also a pile of diffuse stuff extending east and south of the LMC, including these two hooks. hooks. Um, and in addition, something that was a little bit surprising is in comparison to all of this diffuse stuff over here, the western edge of the LMC actually appears to cut off really abruptly. And so a lot of my work has been trying to look at these structures in the outskirts and understand how did they form, how are they linked to different interactions, why are they like they are. But in order to do that, it turns out you actually really need full 3D kinematics. Just these proper motions are not enough. And you might say, well, Lara, but Gaia also gives you spectra now since DR3. That's easy. Uh, unfortunately not, particularly in these low density features, the stars are just too faint for Gaia to give you line of sight velocities, um, like 90% of the time. And so we have to get those from somewhere else. And until now, what I've been using is the Magellanic Edges Survey or MAGES. This is a survey that I PI'd during my PhD. And it's a survey that specifically focuses on these low density structures in the outskirts. It uses the 2DF and AU Omega instrument, which is a multi-fiber dual beam spectrograph on the 3.9 meter Anglo-Australian telescope back home in Australia. And throughout the survey, we observed 44 of these two degree diameter fields, which are these red circles here. Within each one of these fields, we can observe 350 stars at once. And so in total, that gives us line of sight velocities for a little over 12,000 stars, plus some metallicity information for the brighter targets. And so in the next bit of the talk, I'll just highlight a couple of the interesting results that we got from majors. And I'll start with the LMC's northern arm. So the first obvious question is, what is this arm made from? And to do that, we want to look at the metallicities along it. These purple points show the mean metallicities for each of the different points along the arm, or each of the different fields rather. Plus this innermost point is actually not in the arm, but at the base of it in the LMC's disc as like a reference. The pink triangles are just metallicities for individual bright stars where we can get them rather than averages, but we don't always observe those stars in each of our fields depending on when we were observing them. In any case, what we find is that within uncertainties, at least, all of these things have an F on H value of around minus one, consistent with the LMC's outer disk. So it's probably LMC disk material. And there's also potentially a weak hint of a metallicity gradient, rather, as you move outwards along the arm. The stars are getting metal poor. Actually, it was nice to see that there's been some more recent detailed abundance analyses rather than our five points. Um, and so it turns out that those support our conclusions. This bottom plot is showing metallicity distribution functions for some apogee fields. Apogee does uh, higher resolution spectra than we did. Um, they do a lot better at abundances. And their N1 field is at a larger radius along the arm than the N2 field. And you can see that this is indicating that there's a metallicity gradient along the arm as we discovered. And in the top plot, this is just the overall metallicity distribution metallicity distribution function, it is Friday, um, for all of the stars, all of the bright stars, which do have Gaia XP spectra. And that is very similar to the one in the outer disk, the gray line. So overall, we do think this is in fact LMC disk material that's been flung out in this arm. So the next question is, well, what are the kinematics along the arm? How did it form? And to do that, what we first want to do is look at the kinematics of the arm in the frame of the LMC disk, because when we target the red plump stars along the arm, that's most of our targets, um, that's a standardizable candle. And so that means that we can actually derive mean distance estimates for these fields, which then lets us calculate where they sit in the plane of the disk and give us these sort of velocities. And we know that the arm is mostly in the plane of the disk, so this is a sensible comparison to make. Here, what you can see is the azimuthal or rotational velocity, the in-plane radial velocity, in this case, a positive value would mean that the stars are moving outward in the plane of the disk. And then we have the out of plane or vertical velocity here, where in this case, a positive value means motions that are perpendicular to the disk plane in a direction that happens to be mostly towards us. Uh, the gray lines here in these plots would show what you would expect for a perfect equilibrium disk. So for a population of this age and type, you expect a rotational velocity of roughly 70 and then zero net because these are averages within each field zero net radial or vertical velocities. But obviously we find some pretty big deviations from that. Now this increasing vertical velocity we see along the arm is actually pretty easily explainable as just being a result of the LMC's infall to the Milky Way potential. 
in this very rough schematic, basically you can see that the LMC is coming in from underneath the Milky Way's disk plane. And so the gravitational force of the Milky Way is just pulling it in a direction that happens to be mostly aligned with what we define as VZ. So, and because the relative gravitational force of the Milky Way compared to the LMC is stronger at large LMC radii, you naturally just expect this VZ to increase as you move along the arm. But there's no such simple explanation for why you have these enormous negative radial velocities all along the arm. And so in order to try and understand where that was coming from, what we did was to compare our observations to a suite of very, very simple dynamical models. These are not even n-body models, they're just tracer particles in a potential um, that is static even, so a lot less technically you know, savvy than a lot of what everyone here is doing. So don't take these results as being perfect. You know, they're not supposed to quantitatively rep replicate everything that we see. Mainly what we're interested in is what are the sorts of interactions between the clouds that could cause this? And can they potentially affect stars in the regions where we see the structures? So we actually find there are basically three main, at least in the timescales that we run our models only for a gig year, three main types of interactions. And I'll show these schematically in these two plots on the left. On the bottom, you have the total radial distance of the SMC from the LMC. And then in the top plot, you have the vertical distance of the SMC from the LMC's disk plane. Um, and again, these numbers just give you a rough idea of the scale, not absolute. And then here, what I'm showing you is the, disk, the density distribution of a bunch of the particles in one of our simulations as they appear today. So the first sort of interaction we see in all of our simulations is the SMC's recent peripentric passage around the LMC about 150 million years ago, which is good because we know this is a thing that actually happened, so it's nice that it's in all our simulations. But it turns out this is not what is affecting the northern arm. Here on the plot, what I'm showing you is the rough position of the SMC during its pericentric passage um, 150 million years ago, and as this blue cross, and it turns out that this is diametrically opposite from the northern arm, which would be along here. And that's important because this pericentric passage was so young or so recent that there just hasn't been enough time for stars that were perturbed near here to reach all the way around, especially to the furthest reaches of the northern arm, because the dynamical time scales out of the arm are on the order of a giga year or so. So there just hasn't been enough time for this perturbation to propagate basically across the LMC's full disk. So that's not what's causing it. Maybe an alternative is that the SMC actually crossed the LMC's disk plane about 400 million years ago in some of our models. But it turns out this isn't also what's affecting the arm. Now, when I've done this density plot, I'm actually color coding it by the distance of each particle from the SMC during that disk crossing. What you can see is that stars along the northern arm are all yellow, which means they were really far away from the SMC during this disk crossing. So they probably weren't affected by it. Instead, if we wanted to look for debris that is affected by that interaction, we would have to look in the extreme western outskirts of the LMC, where it turns out we see very few stars. So it's not clear that this interaction would have any effect at all if it did happen. Finally, though, in some of our models, we do find that there's a potential simultaneous or near simultaneous pericentric passage and disk crossing of the SMC around the LMC about a giga year or so ago. And we find that maybe stars that are affected in this interaction could in fact today reach the northern arm as this sort of dark purple patch here. And so our current working hypothesis is that in either this interaction or maybe even an older one that we can't quite trace, the stars were first perturbed along the northern arm and then it's not been affected by the SMC, but more recently it has been affected by the LMCs in fall to the Milky Way. Another quick result that I'll present from majors relates to the structures in the southern LMCs outskirts. Again, our question, what are these made of? We look at the metallicities. And again, they're broadly all around the same as the LMC's disk, but there's quite a lot of point-to-point -point variation. And this is probably indicating that there's varying amounts of SMC depending on where you look. And this is again true in those more recent papers. You see that for the individual apogee fields, they can vary a fair bit. And the overall metallicity distribution functions for the bright stars sit in between the LMC and the SMC. So there's definitely SMC debris there, but the amount of debris is really varying strongly depending on where exactly you're looking. Nonetheless, we still want to look at the kinematics of these stars. And again, here we see the radial velocity in plane, the vertical velocity, and here for the first time, the out-of-plane distance, which tells you how far above or below the plane 
this stuff is located. In an equilibrium disk, this would all be zero or it would all be white, but obviously not. These have quite strong differences from that. And we think this is probably due to a combination of interactions, repeated interactions between the LMC and the SMC. When you look at our models, the ones that come closest, um, although close is a relative term here, are inter models which do show these repeated interactions. At least in these models, you get the kinematic trends broadly correct. So, you know, red with red, blue mostly with blue. And this is a lot closer for these models than ones which say only include the SMC's most recent pericentric passage. And the remaining differences here are again due to a combination of the limited, you know, effects of our models. They're not proper dynamical models, only, only, test, only test particles. And also because these models are only including LMC debris. The SMC debris in these fields, it's gonna have its own distinct kinematics that we can't quite separate at the moment. And so that will also cause differences here. So Magus has taken some of the way, but clearly we need more in order to more precisely constrain these older interactions and link them to these things. So there's a couple of things we need. We need better models, obviously. Um, now, some of these do exist. This is a fairly classic one from Gertina Bessler. It's a proper model. It includes gas. It includes the deforming gravitational potentials. It includes mass loss from the SMC. Great. But it's only one model, and there are a limited number of models of this type to actually compare to. So that just by nature of the fact that these are really computationally expensive means we can only learn so much from them because they only cover a certain parameter space. But we might have a bit better or a bit more immediate success is if we have more data. So in particular, rather than just these individual points, what we'd really like is contiguous data across the whole system. And we'd also like this data for stars of multiple different stellar populations, not just the old stars that we've been looking at in majors, but because I told you in the earlier part of the talk, the younger stellar populations have really different morphologies. We want to look at them as well. And the way we're going to do that is with foremost. And you already heard a great talk on Wednesday from Mark about foremost, so I don't need to go over this much. But there are two things that I really want to highlight um, that make foremost a great instrument for this science case in particular. One is that foremost has a really extended field of view over four square degrees, and that's about this many full moons, if that's a scale you care about. Um, in addition, it's very highly multiplexed. Each one of these points represents one of the fibers, which means we're observing over 2,400 stars at once. And that combination of things is really important because not only are the clouds just enormous on the sky, in the central regions, they have a really high target density. And so you need both a really wide field instrument and one that has very high multiplicity in order to actually survey the clouds. Otherwise it would just take you like a million years. So with foremost, what we're gonna do is Hopefully late next year, early 2025, we'll start this big survey of the Southern Hemisphere. And as part of that survey, we're doing a specific targeted survey of the Magellanic clouds called 1001 Magellanic Fields or 1001 MC. This is a survey that I'm co-PIing with my supervisor, Maria Rosa Sioni, and this is really gonna revolutionize the way we look at the clouds. This here is the survey footprint. And you can see that this extends out to a bit more than 15 degrees from the LMC and a bit more than 11 degrees from the SMC. In total, that gives you an area of around 1,000 square degrees, hence the name. And across that area, we're going to observe about a million stars. I've overlaid here just to give you an indication of the rough sort of trajectories of the thin features that we've been looking at with majors, the northern arm, the eastern and southern outskirts. We do a pretty good job at covering these, which is nice, with, unfortunately, the exception of this southern arm. The reason there's this cutout is because there's a hard minus 80 degree declination limit for our survey, not just for ours, for every survey, um, which means that we don't get data for this arm, but because we have some major fields there, we know that we can get this data from other telescopes. So in terms of what stars we'll be targeting across that area, uh, it's more or less every different type of stellar population you can think of. This here is an infrared CMD of the LMC from the VISTA survey of the Magellanic Clouds. And this is one of the target catalogs that we're selecting from. Um, these black boxes here show you the different stellar populations that we'll be covering, including the younger supergiant stars, the intermediate age AGB and new carbon stars, the oldest or predominantly old red giant branch and red clump stars, and main sequence stars and subgiant stars of varying ages. And we also target Cepheids and RR Lyrae as variable stars as yet more different uh, tracer populations to look at. And this is really gonna do an amazing job for the clouds. 
just some quick ideas of things that we'll be able to do. Obviously, we'll be able to get a lot more precise kinematics for all the structures we're looking at and contiguous coverage of them, not just at individual pointings. And we should also be able to measure new substructures that we haven't otherwise been able to identify where we don't have this full 3D information. Another great thing is that we'll be able to get abundances for a lot of these stars. Historically, this has been really difficult in the LMC because it's so far away, it's hard to get, there's a limited number of stars you can get high resolution spectra for, and you have to integrate for a long time to get them. So we'll be able to do a lot better here just because we're targeting a lot more of those stars. And also abundance pipelines have come a long way. So that's going to be really helpful for not just identifying where structures are coming from in terms of being them like LMC or SMC debris, but we should also be able to search for the remnants of even smaller mergers because the LMC is massive enough that it should have experienced maybe a couple of those in its lifetime. And with those abundances, we should also be able to do a better job of looking at star formation history, particularly the ancient star formation history. Um, and we should be able to tie that to both the interactions specifically and to the different structures that they form. So the future is looking really bright for the clouds with foremost. And so I will leave you on that happy note with our summary in that the LMC is a very disturbed low mass disk galaxy. In order to trace the structures within it, we need both abundance data and full 3D kinematics. Until now, we've been using majors to get that and we've made some new discoveries with it in terms of the Northern Arm being LMC debris that's been perturbed by old interactions with the SMC and recent interactions with the Milky Way and the southern outskirts being just a mix of debris has been perturbed repeatedly. But we'll learn a lot more with Foremost, and if you're interested, you can think of, and you think of new ways to exploit this data. I'm sure there's a lot to do with the bar uh, and gas funneling that I have learned a lot more about this week. So if you're interested and you want to work with this data, please do talk to me. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. So questions, please. Thank you very much, uh, Lara, for the nice talk. I was wondering where you were showing the, the velocity and the position maps on the southernmore region. I mm -hmm. don't know if you got that. This yes, one. exactly this one. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the B set and in the set maps, you can see like mm -hmm. on B set there is kind of a dipole in positive yes. and negative. Yes. Regardless, in the set for the same position, everything is red. So it clearly shows like a positive uh, vertical position. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a symmetry no? between the B set and the set on the right and the left part of the galaxy. Do you know like which type of interaction creates this kind of uh, feature? So I think this is related to, so in this one in particular, it's partly related to the disk crossing because the disk crossing happens, okay, so the disk crossing happens here. And so by the time that's happened, the, the stars have sort of moved over here. So I think this is mostly what's that from. But I will give a little bit of caution about this plot in particular is because you have to assume, just we have to assume one fixed inclination to compare and we know that that's not quite true. So what you'd really prefer to do is like model the inclination at each one, like at each point, and then maybe it's not, you don't see such a strong uh, impact, but yeah. Thank you. Very nice talk. I'm really looking forward to see what Formos can do uh, with this galaxy. There will be a lot of nice data. So while the disturbances are very clear in the warp and the kinematic features, etc., and uh, also morphologically, the LMC was always seen as like a lopsided bar. Mm -hmm. um, in some of the deep images you, you, you showed, it looked actually that, that if you go deep enough, it, the disk is very symmetric, right? Uh, morphologically, at least in the bar is right. Mm -hmm at the center of the disk. Yes, yeah, yeah, I know, I know the plots you mean. So that those are a little misleading, I guess, because you have to saturate at such a low density to see um, right. some of the old, the, the very low density features. But yes, it, when you get to the outskirts, it's not that um, like offset. Yeah. The, the bar is more or less in the center, that's, yeah. That's very interesting. And, and, I, and I was wondering if the bar then in this case could help you <clears throat> pinpoint where the center is, right? Because if you saturate the outskirts, mm -hmm. you have this almost perfect disk and, yeah. and, and, and the bar looks like it's right in the center. So the center will be the center of the bar, I guess, like in, in, in regular galaxies. 
hopefully. <laughs> um, yes, I think we'd like to, to test that just to make sure with kinematics. Um, I guess the other thing is that I'm, I'm not sure about and that I'd like to maybe put to the audience is um, people have talked a lot about like gas funneling along the bar and stuff, um, but we don't, there's like characteristic S-shaped velocity contours that you should see. And I think historically we've not seen them in the LMC. And so I don't know what that means. Mm. Um, that it's just, if that means the bar is too young for that to have happened much, if it's like a recent bar, do you ex I guess you do still expect it to form right in the center, yeah? So. Yeah, it could be. It was also interesting when you showed the different stellar populations that you have very young stars uh, aligning the bar, right? So there's <clears throat> some star yeah. formation going on in the bar. So. Yes, yes. Also interesting to look at as well, for sure. Yeah, very interesting. <laughs> this offset the bars. I have a question. How do you define the kinematic center observationally? Ah. You just subtract an average. And... Yeah, so this yeah. is, um, I think, historically, when people have done this in terms of looking at the center, they just build a model, like a kinematic model that says, oh, this is just a regular rotating disk. And then you just fit for what point it's rotating around. And, and you also simultaneously fit for the rotational velocity. Whether or not that's super effective. Do, do you compare with the gas kinematics? Um, people don't tend to look at them at the same time, which I think is a missed opportunity. People have either looked at the gas alone or at the stars alone, not both. And so I think we could learn something if we actually did like a joint fit to see what that's doing. Because what could happen with the offset bar is mm -hmm. a kind of epicyclic motion. The bar is rotating while, mm -hmm. while the, the wall rotates around the common center. So, so you could introduce two, two rotation velocities, in fact. Ah, okay. I'm not an it's expert it's, it's in that. It's a PCT motion. That would be really yeah. neat. If there's like a model and we can prove that, that would be great. Yeah. yeah. Questions? Then we thank you again. Uh, Namita Upal now will speak about the Milky Way as polarization for tracing disk structures and 3D magnetic fields. Hello. Yes. 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 Um. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm Namita Upal. I would like to firstly thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to, to present my work here. I have just recently joined IA Fourth as a postdoctoral fellow. So I will be presenting some of my PhD uh, results here, uh, which is a mapping of the Milky Way disk structure using ISM polarization. So I'll be demonstrating how polarization can be used to map the dust distribution in the galaxy. Uh, so starting with the very basic, we must all have seen this kind of view in the night sky. So this is a part of our Milky Way galaxy. Since we are living inside the galaxy, so we can uh, in, uh, study the individual star with greater detail as compared to any, another, uh, any external galaxy. But at the same time, our position inside the galaxy poses greater challenge to study the global properties of the galaxy. For example, we do not know how our galaxy actually looks like because from our point of view, uh, all the structure features in our line of sight overlap to form this kind of band in the night sky. So, uh, the, which is not a, a complete picture of the galaxy. So, my aim is to construct a 3D map of the Milky Way disk. 
and uh, the basic idea of constructing the 3d map is just to uh, see the distribution of material in the galaxy in the galactic plane by material i mean say gas dust or stars so i am um, a lot of work has been done in this direction and i am mainly interested in uh, studying the distribution of the dust in the galaxy so for example this is the m57 spiral galaxy the jwst image here we can see that dust is highly confined into the galactic plane so by means it is giving us the signature of large scale spiral arm and also it is giving insight into the small scale features that are present within the spiral arm of our galaxy so a similar thing could also be possible for our galaxy but mapping uh, making this map for uh, our own milky way galaxy is quite challenging if we consider the thermal dust emission because thermal dust emission is, will give us the line of sight integrated well, uh, information only so but to construct this map we need a uh, we need to disentangle the dust clouds along the line of sight so so that we can make make a uh, uh, face on view of the galactic plane uh, so directly tracing dust will not uh, help us to create uh, this kind of structures uh, but there are some indirect way for example we can use some properties of the dust like uh, extinction we all know that uh, uh, starlight are, is getting extincted by the presence of the dust uh, cloud in the galactic plane for example that is why we are getting this kind of dark lane in the galactic plane so after gaia there are many 3d extinction map has been formed and but most of these map do not show any spiral structures or else they are highly confined into the solar neighborhood um, this is because partly because this is a derived quantity and we need a lot of assumption to derive the extinction in different line of sight uh, and, but the another property of the dust which is a interstellar polarization uh, which we, here we can see that we are that uh, this plot represent the polarization vectors we are uh, the length of each line black line represent the degree of polarization and its orientation is based on the polarization angle so we can see that where the extinction is high the polarization is also giving us uh, uh, high polarization and this uh, quantity is a directly observed quantity but this has not been used over a global scale to uh, infer the dust distribution so my idea is to use the interstellar polarization uh, over the global scale to see the uh, we can uh, to see if we can study the dust distribution using the polarization so before going into the dust distribution i would like to spend some time on uh, explaining how the uh, uh, how the dust grains are responsible for the polarization so for example this schematic diagram so uh, the starlight polarization was first discovered in late 40s and uh, soon after its discovery many theories has been put forward so this is a simple theory so we let us assume that the star itself is unpolarized star so an unpolarized radiation is coming and it is interacting with the uh, with the uh, interstellar medium having some interstellar grains which we assume that that they are asymmetrical so the simplest kind of asymmetry is a, 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 in asymmetry in the uh, shape of the grain so let us assume they, they are uh, elongated grain so when this starlight interact with this asymmetrical grain so what what will happen uh, a part of light will be absorbed by this grain which is absorbed more in the longer axis of the grain as compared to the shorter axis hence that scattered light will be uh, partially plane polarized towards the shorter axis of the grain and we will get the net polarization even uh, only if there is a, any net alignment of uh, uh, this uh, alignment of axis of symmetry or an isotropy of these grains along some direction which is provided by the local or global magnetic field over there, that region since now uh, that's how we will get the polarization of an um, we get the polarization of an unpolarized star if we observed in optical or near infrared wavelength now because this grains has absorbed some uh, some starlight it will be get re-emitted in the longer wavelength now the longer uh, the light which will be getting re-emitted in the longer wavelength will also be polarized but in a direction which is nine perpendicular to the what we will observe in the optical polarization because the light will be uh, absorbed more in the long towards the longer axis of the grain and then it will uh, in the emission it will show the polarization angle towards that direction so now we know that uh, how the starlight is getting polarized so we we can use ism polarization to infer uh, the plane of sky magnetic field because the polarization angle will give, give the direct proxy of the orientation of the magnetic field over the region 
we can also constrain the dust uh, properties using the polarization measurement and we will use the dust we can also study the dust distribution so my main interest to study the dust distribution and plane of sky magnetic field so going to the first dust distribution part so i'll be using uh, i will i will be using the starlight polarization here because if, if even if we are using the uh, emission polarization for example planck uh, has given a very uh, nice uh, view of the magnetic field structures over the um, uh, over the whole galaxy but it is again a line of sight integ integrated maps uh, it is, we cannot create a 3d uh, maps unless we have the distance information so from gaia we have the distance information of stars so we will be using the stars and the polarization of those stars along with its distance information to infer the dust distribution along the line of sight. So for example, this is a cartoon diagram showing one line of sight having uh, where the stars are distributed at different distances and also has some interstellar clouds. Uh, so what will happen? Uh, uh, for example, for, uh, let us take the first star. So uh, there is no foreground uh, dust cloud, so the polarize, so it will not show any polarization. So it, this is unpolarized star, we'll get a 0% polarization. But moving to the next star, so it, what will happen because there is a one foreground dust cloud where the dust grains are aligned in some particular fashion, let's say, uh, due to the magnetic field. And uh, so we'll get some degree of polarization. For example, let us say we have 2% polarization. Now moving to the third, Third one, we, uh, then uh, it is the light is passing from uh, foreground to clouds and uh, polarization is a cumulative quantity. So it depends on the alignment of the dust grain in these two clouds. If, if there is a, the alignment of these two clouds, are, uh, grains are same, then we'll get the, the polarization will increase for this star. Otherwise it will decrease. In any case, we will find a jump in, the, in polarization, whether it is increasing or decreasing. And in that way, we, we, can see, uh, we can see how many dust clouds are present along our line of sight and we can also constrain their distances. So uh, with this idea, we wanted to see, uh, this is our ideal picture only. So we wanted to see in real observation, what kind of, uh, uh, whether we are able to disentangle the dust cloud along the line of sight or not. So for this, we plan observations and uh, uh, instead of going uh, in an, any random direction, we plan to select an galactic open clusters. Why? Because open cluster, there are a bunch of stars present at the same location, same distance. So it will be easy to constrain the polarization properties uh, statistically uh, as compared to any random direction. There are a total of 7,200 uh, uh, clusters that are known till now after Gaia. This is the distribution of these uh, 7200 cluster uh, in the face on view of the galaxy. And uh, only 40 cluster has been observed uh, using polarization observation. That two uh, uh, cluster properties to see the cluster properties itself, not according to the global properties of the galaxy. So these are highlighted by these black dots and their distance is uh, more or less at approximately three kiloparsec. So what we wanted, we wanted to select the cluster in the same line of sight, but at different, different distances so that in a one line of sight, we can probe as many dust clouds as, as possible. So for the selection, we wanted to select a somewhat older cluster so that they are not expected to have intra-cluster dust. So whatever be the uh, signature they are giving, they will be giving the signature of the foreground dust, uh, uh, dust cloud uh, information. And also based on the um, observation, uh, other observation aspect, we selected some cluster. We selected clusters in the anti-center direction, now closer to the anti-center direction. Now why anti-center direction? So it is known that the, this direction is characterized by the low extinction. So we can uh, observe deeper and go because we are uh, going to have uh, perform the observation in the optical. So we can go in deeper and uh, can probe the distant features of the galaxy. And uh, secondly, because if we wanted to rely on the dust emission, if we wanted to rely on the dust emissions, uh, so um, uh, dust emission properties, and we uh, for the distance we are using kinematic distance. So what will happen? Kinematic distance will be uh, from the radial velocity measurement, but in this direction, the velocity majorly the velocity component will be along the 
plane of the sky not uh, in the radial direction hence there are uh, uh, the kinetic distance derived from this radial velocity measurement will be highly uncertain so we we'll cannot rely on the features that we have, uh, will be getting from those so in total polarization in combination with the distance is the only uh, and serve best to understand the dust distribution in this particular direction so we uh, observed five cluster uh, from 2 kiloparsec to approximately 6 kiloparsec uh, in distance and for the observation we carried out the observation using a meter class telescope and using a imaging polarimeter this is a uh, image of that uh, uh, instrument at the back end of 1.4 meter telescope and this is its schematic diagram i will not go into the detail but i will um, it, it the instrument has a half wave plate that is used for the modulation of the starlight it has a volaston prism that will is used as an analyzer so it will uh, uh, split the light into two orthogonally polarized states so in uh, to give an idea how the observed image look like uh, this is a dss image of one of the cluster and this is observed image so here we can see that for every single star there is there are two images this is because of the because we last time has split the uh, light into two component uh, uh, two orthogonally polarized component by measuring the flux of these orthogonally polarized component we can find the degree of polarization and polarization angle that we need for our further analysis so uh, after doing all this we uh, reduce uh, the data for all our cluster direction and this is a vector map for uh, towards uh, all five cluster direction here the uh, red or black lines represent the uh, polarization segment where the length of each line corresponds to the degree of polarization and orientation Uh, gives the proxy of the magnetic field direction and this gray line represent the orientation of the galactic plane so from all the picture we can see that uh, more more or less the uh, magnetic field is aligned uh, very well with the galactic plane except from few direction like especially in this direction we can see that there is, uh, magnetic field is uh, giving some some curvilinear morphology to explore in more detail uh, we used the herschel 250 micron intensity image for uh, uh, this is a integrated map and we can see that there is a loop kind of structure and the magnetic field is following that loop so we can see that the polarization is very helpful to study the spatial morphology on the sky plane and uh, also the magnetic field uh, how the magnetic field is interacting with the uh, the dust clouds this is one of the uh, property that, that we can explore using the uh, satellite polarization but my main focus was to see the dust distribution along the line of sight so for that we uh, combined the polarization information with the distance from gaia so here i plotted the degree of polarization towards one of the cluster uh, and the polarization angle and uh, in the bottom panel the reddening uh, taken from one of the 3d extinction map uh, as a function of distance and to see the smooth variation we have been the data in 2250 parsec bins to uh, in the green lines to see a smooth variation and we can see that at least at two places we can see a jump in the polarization at the same time the polarization angle is also showing a jump from here to here and then after this point the spread in the polarization angle is decreases so this implies that at least two dust layers in this direction are present by this is a from visual inspection on this so from visually we can see that two dust layers are present in this direction we checked the our uh, uh, interpretation uh, uh, using an independent method uh, bayesian based uh, decomposition of starlight polarization in 1d this algorithm was developed for uh, upcoming polarization survey in optical uh, but for uh, for the higher latitude and um, i was applying the same for the the galactic plane studies and it also gives us a signature that there are uh, two dust layers that are um, actually three dust layers that are present along this line of sight and we repeated the exercise for all the clusters and we can see that there are um, at least two dust layers are present towards each line of sight so this is the for towards the individual cluster direction now uh, whether combining the all the information give us the large scale structure information or not so we combined the this data that the uh, dust cloud distance of the dust cloud that we have found for each cluster direction here and i have overplotted the expected uh, distance of the spiral arms uh, in this di anti center di towards anti center direction and what we can see that we can see that mo mostly the dust clouds are coinciding with the di distance of the spiral arms 
so for example uh, if we consider these two uh, clusters so they are giving us the signature they, they are uh, um, uh, showing a dust layer at 2 kiloparsec which is coinciding with the perseus arm of the uh, galaxy and moving to the distant cluster they are coinciding with the outer arm of the galaxy so in short uh, majority of the dust cloud are like lying in the spiral arm of the galaxy so this is a for this is just for a demonstration purpose where we have uh, conducted observation in one single line of sight but imagine if we can do uh, a spatial coverage and then we can resolve the dust distribution along the uh, uh, along each line of sight then we can uh, actually see the uh, dust distribution in the uh, in the face on view of the galaxy and they, they will give us insight about the underlying spiral structure of the galaxy uh, in, in in addition to this i wanted to emphasize that here uh, for these two cluster um since the light is passing from all the spiral arms but we are getting signature of the outer arm not of the perseus arm we are not getting any dust cloud which is lying uh, closer to the perseus arm of the galaxy so what could be the reason for this uh, there could be two reason for example there could be some local effect this is to just to give an analogy for example this is our line of sight it may happen that uh, in the uh, our line of sight the in the perseus arm there is very less dust or a low extinction window is there so uh, that's why due to uh, less dust content the polarization of background star will not change much <laughs> hence we are not getting any signature about the perseus arm of the galaxy uh, however there could be another reason there could, it could be local uh, sorry global feature um this we know that our milky way disk is not uh, uh, having equal thickness but the thickness is increasing uh, increasing with the radial distance so it is a flared galaxy it has been uh, proven many uh, um, distribution studies and uh, uh, it means that the perseus arm will be uh, less thicker as compared to the outer arm and if we see the latitude of these two uh, latitude of these two clusters uh, plus 3 and minus 3.6 which is a bit uh, more as compared to the other observa uh, observations and uh, it may happen that our line of sight is not crossing the uh, perseus arm it is directly crossing the outer arm that's why we are not getting any signature of the perseus arm of the galaxy uh, but we are getting signature of the outer arm so uh, in order to see which one is true we need a uh, uh, more special coverage if uh, it the same signature still persists that it means that this is due to the uh, flare structure of the galaxy otherwise uh, it, it could be local structures within some line of sight so in 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 uh, in conclusion i would like to say that uh, uh, whether it is a small scale structure or large scale structure polarization starlight polarization along with the distance measurement will give us insight about the uh, local and as well as the global features of the galactic disk so to summarize this uh, starlight polarization is a very useful tool to disentangle the line of sight dust distribution which we cannot do by other methods and it trace the underlying structures but we need a large polarization surveys to be carried out there is a forthcoming pacify survey in optical uh, but it will be covering the high latitude region not the galactic plane but we need a similar kind of survey in the galactic plane there is no uh, survey yet available completely covering the galactic plane but there is a, another survey which is uh, covering a substantial portion of the galaxy uh, uh, in near infrared uh, for the polarization so um, in my postdoc i am expanding my work uh, to uh, explore this data in detail so that we can uh, make a magnetized ism in 3d map of the magnetized ism in this uh, portion of the galaxy so um, the aim is to see whether we are getting any uh, spiral kind of uh, structures in the uh, in the magnetic field or not and whether they, they are related to the material arms or not uh, so these are the main objective of our uh, study and this is the uh, polarization plot representing uh, the average polarization or the magnetic field uh, direction in the galactic plane here we can see that magnetic field is not always following the uh, galactic plane or not always parallel to the galactic plane there are some region where there is a, a larger angle even perpendicular to the galactic plane but again this is the line of sight integrated map so we are not distance this is not distance resolved and uh, 
we crudely check the data to uh, in three dimension to see how the magnetic field look like so we see that there is a from colors we can see that there is a, a quasi periodic wavy pattern in the polarization angle which is a proxy of the magnetic field there is a quasi periodic wavy uh, magnetic uh, pattern in the magnetic field so but this is again uh, the voxel size that we have used is very large we are uh, in the process of developing a method in which we can uh, split the data complete uh, whole data into the um, beams into the uh, suitable beams and then we can work on decomposition of the starlight polarization in each direction automatically and uh, see the 3d view of the magnetized ism so this is a, a, a still in progress so we hope we'll get the result soon and if we get the the same pattern and with a suitable with a fixed frequency then it it will provide a strong constraint for the galactic magnetic field model and it will be the like first map of the magnetic ism in three dimensional so i would like to uh, end my talk here with uh, thanks for listening Many thanks namita questions thank you this is really interesting work um, I have two questions. The first one is on these 3D dust maps um, and uh, about how much resolution you're able to get on the uh, dust distribution that you're inferring. Yeah, I understand that there are points where you can say, okay, there's definitely at least this much mass of dust in these regions because otherwise we wouldn't have the polarization results that we have. Yeah. C can you tell the, the width, the density, the height of those dust features or is it just telling you that there must be dust of at least a certain amount within a particular space? So our idea is to find the distance of the dust layers. So not uh, in that sense that uh, that if there is a cloud, how much uh, in uh, spatial range, uh, how it is uh, distributed. But the, actually, the, just to get an idea of the distance of the dust cloud, so that here there is a dust cloud, whether they are able to see the morphology of our large scale structures of the galaxy or not. So this is our aim. But the next thing is that uh, since uh, this is a star by star measurement, so it will be high resolution. So if we are deciding the size of the beam, which we are, will be working. So if the beam will, it, the resolution of the map will depend upon the beam size. So we are still working on that. Okay, thank you. And the, the other question about magnetic fields. Um, the um, assumption on the shape of dust grains in order to give you your magnetic field direction, do we have any sort of uh, idea of how confident we are in that assumption, uh, what, what dust grain shapes are actually like and how much of an error that might result in, in terms of your magnetic field directions? So dust grain shape is, does not matter, I think. Uh, it depends, it is uh, that the dust grain should be asymmetrical. So asymmetry could be in anything. The simplest way to visualize is to see the shape of the grain. But yes, the, if this is the shape of the actual grain, then the preferred geometry where they will orient is the towards the shorter axis of the grain. So the dust grain must have oriented in, uh, in the uh, with the magnet uh, with the, its shorter axis parallel to the magnetic field. Only then we can get the information. This has been cross-checked to using the uh, synchrotron uh, emission. So a particular area has been observed in synchrotron as well as in. Uh, uh, ISM polarization and the magnetic field uh, uh, from both the field has been uh, uh, compared and it has been uh, observed that this should be the case if we want to uh, have similar result as the uh, synchrotron emission. Great, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? If not, we think again. And now the next speaker is Ahlam Farhan. Just the mic. The Shifrin Water Mega Major Galaxy. Title of the talk.
which one is yours? Uh, yes. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ahlam Farhan, and I thank all organizers to have let me have the chance to present my work in uh, water mega major galaxies. So here are the main outlines of my talk. I will be introducing the topic because it's not a much familiar topic in astronomy. Uh, I will talk about the importance of water mega majors, why you study them. And I will talk about uh, the MCP, the Mega Major Cosmology Project. I will talk about the main problem in major studies, which is challenges in detecting water mega major. And I will talk a little bit about my work at the end of the talk, uh, how we start to relate AGN with major, and I will wrap up with conclusions. First of all, MASER stands for microwave amplification by stimulated emission by, of radiation, exactly like the very known laser, but the microwave band. Uh, the theory of MASER was established by Einstein, as we all know, in 1917, and it was materialized by Charles Owens in 1953, for which he owned the Nobel Prize with his colleagues for uh, this work. The discovery of astrophysical measures. So we said that first was it built in the laboratory here in the ground. And then in 1965, they discovered that there is some major emission from space coming from space. So at that time, the ironic fact that most of the researchers didn't believe that molecule could exist in the space because of the harsh condition. So how you can convince them to believe that there is maser, there is amplified, which means hundreds of thousands of molecules of water in the space. So it was a little bit challenging. And for that reason, they called that the first maser discovered, they called it the mysterium. So no one knew what is it. It's something mysterious. We don't believe that it is molecule. Something maybe happened uh, in the analysis or uh, in the errors. Uh, but not later, after that year, they started to discover measure from other molecules. That those molecules like water, hydroxide, silicon uh, oxide, or meth methanol, that we have major emission from them in the laboratory, and we have exactly the same emission line from the space. <laughs> to add confirmation to the discovery, in 1973, they discovered the first Maser from extragalactic, or even they extended the distance. And it was followed by the discovery of water maser, which I will be talking about, which is my subject. From now on, I will not talk about other uh, astrophysical measures. By the way, they call it astrophysical maser just to distinguish it from the one that we build in the lab and we use it. So here is the ortho configuration of water molecules. We have these two rotational. Ortho means that uh, both of the hydrogen uh, atoms are spinning opposite way uh, in the water molecules. So we have this uh, rotational transition that gives exactly like 22 gigahertz line. And this is what we call water measure or water vapor measure. Uh, the characteristics of water measures are, they are found to be in dense, warm, this density, and higher than 300 Kelvin densities. And we have two type of astrophysical measures. We have the galactic measures, the measure spots that we can find in the Milky Way, inside the Milky Way, they have luminosity, more like less than uh, 10 to the power minus four. And we have extragalactic measures. For extragalactic measures, they are typically exceeding 100 luminosity of the sun. So you can see that the difference between galactic measure and extragalactic measure is big. That's why we call extragalactic measure mega measures because they are million times more luminous than galactic ones. Why we study major galaxies or extra? Now, now one, I will be talking just about mega major galaxies, which means the one from, ex, not from the galactic one, the extra galactic ones. And we call them mega major galaxies because 
even if their major uh, luminosity is small, like one luminosity of the sun, the tradition happened that we call them mega, whatever the luminosity. So we study mega major, water mega major galaxies because they're important in accurate black hole mass measurement. I can say that they are the only mean that we can constrain the black hole mass in AGN. So they have direct way to uh, spot them. Using BLBI and big radio dishes, we can spot uh, molecular clouds uh, very accurately using milli arc second resolution to track one by one of these points you see of the amazing disk. You can imagine this is the uh, supermassive black holes at the uh, center, and we have the accretion disk that you all know about it. And we have a torus, like donut-shaped torus of dense gas that somehow maybe you can consider them at the outer region of the accretion disk. Using the LBI and rig dishes, as I said, we can spot them and uh, practically measure these three quantities. We can look at the angular dress, uh, the angular uh, distance of them in the sky, theta. We can also measure the velocity of them from their redshift, blue shift. And we can also monitor them for a couple of years. So we can, for each spot, we can say that it has acceleration in that direction. So we can also calculate the acceleration. Having these three uh, parameters, we can put them in simple uh, Kepler, uh, Keplerian uh, orbit. And we can conclude that mass of the included particle here, which is eventually the uh, supermassive bl uh, black hole. Uh, this is uh, the precise uh, mass of black holes. Uh, astronomers have so far uh, able to accurately calculate 15 galaxies um, black hole masses from uh, using this uh, measure technique. And the second importance of uh, major uh, galaxies is the ability to measure the distance. As I said before, we have theta, we have V and acceleration, we can put them in the uh, equation and, and then calculate the distance to the hosting galaxies. So here is the mm, typical spectrum of the, the 22 gigahertz of these galaxies. We have triple peak, the systemic, systematic uh, velocity, the red shifted velocity, and blue shifted velocity. Uh, astronomers have so far calculated five. Let me see, there is another galaxy missing here. Let's say six galaxies. They calculated the distance to them with one direct method. Uh, the, specific, the unique thing about major, about this, uh, you may say that the accuracy is not so much big, but this is the only way that we can calculate the distance directly without relying on the uh, microwave, uh, cosmic microwave background or uh, distance ladders. So it is a direct method. And the other importance of major, uh, water mega major galaxies is they are the only mean to just trace the subparsec of the AGN. So you can trace them with accuracy less than one parsec. You can study the dy dynamics of them and uh, can have some information about the physics going there. Let me just introduce the MCP, the Mega Major Cosmology Project. This project aiming to study the distance to uh, water mega major galaxies when we eventually have a lot of them. And then they will use it to constrain the Hubble parameter to the accuracy of 3%. So they can help in solving the tension, the, you know, the Hubble tension between the early and the late uh, universe. So they aim to have like 10 galaxies that we have accurate measurement, I said that we have already six of them. We still have four or like four or five galaxies more, and then we will reach to uh, constraining the Hubble parameter with a very accurate uh, uh, value. So the problem with studying mega-measure galaxies is the detecting problem that we have 
They, they are very rare kind of galaxies. The over 6,000 galaxies have been observed, surveyed, and hundreds of observational nights have been conducted using big dishes because it needs a high resolution. But we just only have 200 galaxies. So imagine that from these 200 galaxies, some of them are not related to the AGN. So we call them uh, star burst related mega measures. So we are interested just in the part that is related to the active galactic nuclei, which is uh, roughly 60 percentage of them. So we have like up to now, they could uh, look and configure the Keplerian orbit inside like 60 galaxies just from all of these uh, 200 galaxies. So this is a very uh, uh, big problem in how to find them. They are uh, over five decades, they have been studying and looking for major galaxies and they could just find this small number. So the other problem in studying uh, mega major galaxies is the complexity of physics inside the accretion, uh, the outer, outer uh, part of the accretion uh, disk. So we don't know either the accretion um, environment physics, or we don't even know uh, how uh, major are being produced exactly inside uh, uh, that places. So what is the solution for this problem? Astronomers have been looking for trends. So let's say that we have these 6,000 galaxies. They are surveyed, and we found that uh, 200 are major, the other, the rest, the big sample, we call it non-major. So starting to do comparison, let's look at the radio uh, luminosity of major and non-major. Let's look at X-ray and etc. So they could find some general trends for them. For example, they found that they are almost exclusively found in C42 galaxies. So we said to the uh, radio telescope, don't look for C41, you were wasting your time, just look for C42. The other trend is they have higher hydrogen column densities. So, and the interesting thing that researchers have found that their X-ray spectra is very complicated. You can see this is non amazing galaxies. They have the well-known X-ray spectra, but for major galaxies, there is something going on. They also have uh, uh, elevated, elevated uh, luminosity in radio and in all white colors. So some of the trends that I have showed you can be directly uh, explained using the unification scheme of AGN that major prefer C42 galaxy because when we have C42, it means that we are looking edge on, on the galaxy. So the uh, molecules have a long path to do the amplification and then we get a more luminous uh, major. Let me come to the trend that I have found in my work. Uh, I have studied the dense tracer, specifically these two lines, the ground state transition of them, because HCN and HCO plus are known to be a good dense tracer uh, in galactic. I uh, managed to have the um, sample of like 30 galaxies with uh, these two lines, and then I started to study the, the relation between major and these lines. And we could finally find some trends that, yes, we can look at galaxies with high density tracers luminosity. They will give us ultimately a higher luminous uh, in major. So this was accord, uh, in accordance with the theory that then the denser the accretion disk is more likely to have uh, enough bath for water molecules to be amplified and to give a strong measure. Even after I, we excluded, we tried to exclude the ultraluminous galaxies because they have a lot of star bursts inside them and we don't want to have some uh, scatter in our result. And we could see that there is a perfect, almost perfect correlation between this uh, gas, dense gas tracer and our measure uh, sample. So, we said that maybe we can use in the future survey HCO plus to uh, look for uh, luminous major galaxies. 
which was according to theory, as I said. But the second uh, trend that we tried to find, it's logically that when we have AGN with higher mass black hole at the center, it means more accretion rate, it means more power for the measure, and we should expect more luminous measure. But we uh, collected the accurate measurement of black holes, and we found that the relation is rather scattered. So it was not up to expectation. So we were shocked with the results that there is no any correlation between, it's like random, and it's not related to AGN directly. And the last that I will show you is uh, the interesting anti-correlation that we have found. Again, according to theory, we should expect that when the X-ray is high and the X-ray well, emission line is high, we can find more luminous uh, measures. But uh, after we analyze the uh, iron K alpha line, which is the most prominent emission line in all AGN spectra, we collected the data for that line using XMM. And we studied the correlation. We found that luminous major galaxies have very low, uh, have luminous, uh, sorry, luminous major galaxies have very low uh, iron K alpha line emission. So, which was against theory, not as expected. Uh, as I said, physics of major and uh, the very special kind of uh, that torus is not well understood. So we couldn't find an um, interpretation, maybe possible interpretation that we can say major galaxies uh, are existed in some kind of AGN, which have a very complex, not just in X-ray uh, spectra, have very complex uh, physical uh, environments. And we also found out the orientation of the amazing uh, clouds, water clouds, might be different from the inclination of the galaxy itself. So it's not just looking at CIFR2 galaxies. We have to uh, uh, constrain the inclination of the amazing spots. So to conclude, I'm not detaining you much for the lunch. Understanding measures in, A in AGNs, we have found in some uh, interesting uh, um, uh, trends, we have no strong correlation, and which is against theory. We have much work here to do. Uh, we concluded that uh, the characteristics of AGN for the hosting galaxies should be a very complex one with a special kind of uh, AGN. Uh, we are looking too much forward to new generation, next generation uh, BLA that will give us produce more accurate uh, tracing for the major uh, spots. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. Does anybody want to ask something? As far as I understand, there is uh, nothing to be proposed now for the origin of uh, this uh, uh, mega major uh, stuff that we find. You cannot correlate it with uh, the mass of the black hole or something is... Uh, if one would like to say, okay, this is the physics behind, what would you propose right now based on what we already know? Uh, we, there is something in the specific kind of AGN that uh, maybe the scatter in uh, the black hole uh, calculation or the bias in the data might be the reason for that. But, we still don't know. We, it's, it's like primitive uh, work. Uh, even the theoretical work in MASER is really weak. We don't see a lot of uh, papers. I don't know the reason for that. A lot of that. Thank you. I, I, I wonder uh, how far are we to make imaging? with uh, the extended VLBA. Uh, and the prospects are more for mega masers or Milky Way laser, laser. No, we don't, we don't care much about galactic measure. We expected to discover new ones. 
just the primitive. Tell us yeah. that there is a, uh, more than three sigma of uh, observation or detection in that galaxy, and it would be a good uh, win for us because there are 200. Just when you I discover mean, new of them, I mean, if, if we LPA, we, we could make images of, of these objects. Ah, there is a, a yeah. proposal for that because uh, the ability of a next generation VLBA is uh, higher to detect them. Maybe there is maser in some galaxies, but because they are very faint, yeah. and we cannot detect them. And even we don't have a maser in the far galaxy. Yeah. Most of them under 100 mega megaparsec. So we're looking forward to look at high redshift galaxies. There are proposals for uh, uh, surveying the high redshift because maybe they have another physics or they have interesting things because for maser to come to that distance, it means that they are very, very luminous uh, maser. So they are valuable. Mm -hmm. This is what you expect from that. But the expected size in physics, physical scale, is it uh, some uh, one AU or one? Uh, the, the closest measure galaxy is just 7.2 uh, megaparsec. The, the, the size of the measures, we have no idea of the oh, you mean the, the, the milli arc second? Yes. Oh, they are in order of uh, five milli arc second or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It depends on their distance, of course, but yeah. usually uh, in order of uh, milli arc second. So if you have uh, small radio dishes, you cannot resol uh, resolve them. You can't observe, observe them. You need milli arc second resolution for that. Mm -hmm. okay. so. Someone else? Then uh, if not, we thank her. Ah, okay. Thank you. We can win back at three o'clock uh, for the afternoon session. Okay. No, no, no.
We can start the afternoon session. The first speaker is Evgenia Kutsumbu, and she will be speaking about the impact of cosmic rays on gas cloud. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, it's very nice to be here, and I would like to thank the Academy of Athens for this opportunity and this beautiful conference. Um, yes, my name is Evgenia. I'm doing a PhD uh, in the University of Athens. And today I'm going to talk to you about uh, a project we did, quite different than uh, other uh, talks uh, in this conference, uh, with my collaborators there, uh, which is on cosmic rays and their impact on uh, galactic uh, gas clouds. Uh, so to begin with, with an artistic interpretation of a galaxy, uh, we can see here a, a galaxy and the gas inflowing and outflowing and uh, many, many pro processes happening there. But what is uh, our main focus? Uh, our main focus lies on the excitation mechanisms of uh, gas clouds within uh, starburst and AGN galaxies. And uh, of course, there is photoionization coming from AGN, uh, the, the accreting disk. Also, there are shocks. Uh, there are collisions, heating, heating and X-ray heating. And there is also cosmic rays, which will be our main focus in this project. Uh, you heard a lot of about AGN feedback also by uh, Dr. Annelise Odebert uh, this morning. Uh, so going on, uh, when talking about cosmic rays, uh, what do we mean? We mean the highly energetic particles that come from a jet, possibly if there is a jet in an AGN, if we have a jet uh, at, at least. Uh, so here we see that uh, the jet uh, accelerates uh, these particles and they can either interact in high energy regime, high energy processes, but they can also meet the gas within uh, the clouds and ionize and excite it. Um, okay, we again, I, I talked to you about also starburst galaxies and cosmic rays there. Cosmic rays in starburst galaxies are found are accelerated uh, in supernova remnants. The, the material expanding can accelerate uh, these particles and also have the same effect in the, gal in the ga galaxy clouds uh, as well in these objects. Okay, uh, now uh, going on to the PPT diagrams. These are very diagnostic diagrams and are used uh, to the, to separate the different categories of galaxies. Uh, we can see here, oh, yeah, we can see here, this is, uh, this curve is the Curie line. Above uh, this, sources uh, with line ratios as described uh, from nitrogen over its alpha, oxygen three over its beta, uh, can consider the AGN-like sources. Uh, in the same uh, way, uh, this kind of perpendicular line divides the Seifert linear objects. And uh, why I show you this, this is a very nice diagnostic diagram to study the uh, excitation mechanisms in the ionized uh, gas. And there are a lot of works doing exactly this, uh, reproducing with models uh, the parameter space falling uh, in the linear Seifert AGN-like area. And this is what we're going to do as well. Uh, our motivation behind doing so is that um, uh, so far, uh, these areas have been uh, modeled with uh, mainly photoionization and shocks and do not include cosmic rays even in environments where cosmic rays are present and uh, have used the higher than solar metallicities. Uh, for example, in this, um, in this plot, which is the PBT for nitrogen over its alpha, oxygen 3 over its beta, we can see that uh, the, the region of interest, which we want to model, is modeled with um, this isometallic, uh, th these are the isometallic uh, surfaces, lines, and these are the photonization lines. So we see here that these models are kind of falling between two and four solar metallicity, metallicities, which is kind of extreme. Uh, so what we wanted to test is a new uh, kind of um, mechanism behind reproducing this particular area on the PVTs. Uh, and we introduced cosmic rays along with uh, a solar metallist. Okay, to our observational data, our galaxy sample, uh, we chose uh, Centaurus A, which is a very radio loud galaxy and the, it is expected to have cosmic rays uh, here. 
Also, we've chosen CETEN 68, which is again an AGN uh, with more compact sets and uh, some starburst areas uh, around the, uh, the edges in the more distant area uh, regions. And also NGC 253 in the middle, uh, which is a starburst galaxy, but has, as of recent, very, uh, um, there are a lot of words that uh, have estimated the cosmic ray ionization rate from uh, molecular chemistry. Also, we used as a check source for the photoionization uh, case NGC 1320. Uh, okay, uh, so for the three main uh, galaxies at hand, uh, we chose different areas to extract the PPT lines. Uh, we tried to take areas uh, falling in the jet rail and also uh, away of the jet rail. And of course, uh, a lot of areas in NGC 253 as well. Uh, here you can see the apertures and the jets. Okay, uh, for each of these apertures, uh, we extracted all the PPT lines. We fitted them, for example, this is the, the outcome for one aperture, aperture two coming from Centaur Shay, and we also treated them for extinction. Uh, then uh, we are going to our modeling uh, procedure. We used uh, Cloudy, which is a photonization uh, radiative transfer code, and give us this particular code gives us the opportunity to incorporate also cosmic ray ionization rate in our models. Uh, we uh, had two different kinds of models, one for the AGN uh, regime and one for uh, the starburst. Uh, we chose a simplified black body for the starburst case and the AGN uh, typical set uh, reproduced by Cloudy uh, for the two AGNs. And uh, our range of parameters uh, is uh, minus 3.5 log ionization. This is the ionization parameter for ionization up to minus 1.5. Uh, a very range uh, initial density, so we have uh, a big grid and covering uh, many properties of the gas. Uh, cosmic ray ionization rates of from minus 14, from 10 to the minus 14 up to 10 to the minus 12. And we also used one solar metallicity, which in particular for these galaxies, we constrained it uh, from the chi chemistry routines of parents material 2014-2000. Uh, 19. So we see here that the solar metallicity in these particular uh, sources is at most 1.1 1 .1, uh, 1 and 1.2, uh, so making that the assumption for one solar metallicity a uh, quite good uh, uh, option, quite good uh, assumption. So putting all of this together, we created our own PPTs. Uh, at the Top row, we can see the PPTs for nitrogen over its alpha, sulfur over its alpha, same, the column the same. But the top row is for 10 to the minus 14 uh, cosmic ray ionization rate. And uh, the models going from white to red, uh, deep red represents the highest photoionization case. Also, we can see here uh, in, um, in purple, uh, the observations were, were exactly, not exactly, but were approximately fall uh, in, uh, a in uh, considering the nucleus. So we have the deepest purple being the nuclear uh, regions and near the jets, and then the pale uh, white lilac being the most distant apertures uh, of uh, each object. We also have uh, NGC 1320 uh, point to reproduce the highly photonized, photoionized uh, scenario. And uh, doing uh, this, uh, we can see that, okay, going 10 to the minus 14 does not make the models move towards the observations. But going a little bit higher, uh, parametrically studying this effect, we see that 10 to the minus 13 works quite well for uh, the self for PPT. Uh, okay, but are these kind of cosmic rays expected in this particular uh, object, this particular galaxy? Uh, yes, we did kind of a synchrotron estimation from the uh, electron component, and we see that especially near the jets, this kind of cosmic rays could be found. Uh, then, going a little bit higher, even 10 to the minus 12, we see here that 
we can also fit in, with this cosmic rate ionization rate the nitrogen 2 over, over its alpha. Uh, the bottom row is the same uh, cosmic rate ionization rate, but for uh, the, the, the models now are noted for the different uh, initial densities uh, in green. Uh, moving on to NGC 68, we saw a very similar uh, behavior. Again, uh, 10 to the minus 14 is not working uh, for um, our observations coming from NGC 1068 and its aperture, uh, but uh, 10 to the minus 13 uh, works for sulfur 2 PPT and going on again, 10 to the minus 12 works for the nitrogen 2 uh, PPT, PPT uh, pretty well. Again, uh, with a synchrotron fit, uh, because we have radio jets uh, in this galaxy, we saw here that this galaxy is capable of having uh, that high of cosmic rate ionization rates. Uh, then we wanted to test the scenario on um, a galaxy that has measurements of um, the cosmic rate ionization rate in these uh, three works from the chemistry uh, within its molecular gas clouds. And what we saw, uh, even for the simplistic uh, uh, black body uh, assumption of uh, the initial spectrum, we saw again that the models are affected in a very similar way, uh, meaning that 10 to the minus 14 is not capable of reproducing uh, this area of uh, the observations coming from NGC 253, but 10 to the minus 13 works for self for two, sorry, self for two, and uh, 10 to the minus 12 worked for nitrogen two. Where is it? Yeah, sorry, here and uh, here. Uh, so, uh, this, has ma this makes us uh, wonder, is this because the nitrogen and sulfur 2 uh, emission is boosted or something else might catastrophic in the other lines is happening? And we went on to see what exactly happens, first of all, with the temperature of our models within the depth of the cloud. And what we saw here um, is that Okay, this is the green line is for an ionization parameter, a mean ionization parameter of minus two, log u uh, equals minus 2.6, and the blue for minus 2.0. And we saw here that the behavior is quite similar. Uh, there is a photo ionized area, the, the photons dominate that part of the cloud because it's the face of the cloud. And then uh, the dotted uh, line. I always miss it. <laughs> the dotted lines uh, represent the highest cosmic ray ionization rate here, and the dust dot the middle cosmic ray ionization rate, while the solid one is the lowest uh, case. So we see that as we go deep inside the cloud, uh, the, cosmic, the, the lowest cosmic ray ionization rate does not boost again the temperature, but 10 to the minus 12, which is the highest, keeps, keeps the temperature high enough, sustains in both cases, in both kinds of models, the temperature high enough. So this, is, this seems to be the effect of the cosmic rays. Uh, we went on because Cloudy gives us this opportunity to study uh, the emission lines as well within the depth and studied, for example, sulfur 2 and saw that the behavior of the temperature is mirrored uh, also in sulfur 2. We see here the emissivity of sulfur 2 going up for the biggest ionization, uh, cosmic rate ionization rate, and the same in both uh, kind of models. Uh, nitrogen two is uh, again quite the same; it's also uh, affected. Oxygen three, which is also uh, an optical line of the PPT diagrams, it's kind of affected in a similar way. And then we have H alpha. H alpha seems to not be that much affected by the cosmic rays as the low ionization lines before. Uh, and H beta, again, it's not that much affected. Oxygen 3 is, ca is kind of a uh, bit in between. So putting them all back together, these are the PPTs uh, I showed you before, but combined. Uh, we have here all the observational points from all our sources uh, falling inside the contours for 10 to the minus 12 uh, nitro in the nitrogen 2 PPT diagrams. And uh, for sulfur 2, uh, we have the contours of 10 to the minus 13 uh, ATN models. Uh, the, the purple contours are ATN models. The red behind them 
in both cases are the star forming models. Also, we plot here the parameter space where uh, we have the Milky Way values of cosmic rays around 10 to the minus 16. And we see that this kind of uh, cosmic ray ionization rate, it's not, uh, it's not that capable of re reproducing the linear Seifert uh, part of the PPT, the mission there. Um, okay, going a little bit further, we wanted to check what exactly happens uh, between the temperature and the photonization parameter U. Uh, we produced these uh, stability plots, uh, which uh, show us uh, this. Uh, C is uh, a different way to express the uh, ionization parameter. Log U is uh, the photonization parameter I talked to you about before. And we see here that for very extreme photonization, uh, we have gas very, very hot, uh, coronal gas in the aging. Uh, case. Of course, in the star forming models, we do not reach that high temperature. And um, as we follow the three lines, the three lines are for the three different cosmic ray and ionization rates. We see that they go together up to a point uh, where the photonization fall, falls. There's not that much of a uh, log u parameter. Uh, this could happen, of course, deep within a cloud where the photons cannot reach uh, these areas. This happens again also for the star forming models. And we see here that the green line being produced by models of 10 to the minus 12 is capable of uh, keeping uh, the temperature within the cloud, uh, regardless of the photonization parameter, even if it gets very low, uh, to 10 to the fourth, 10,000 Kelvin, which means uh, that there is uh, the, the, the heat, the, the, the mechanism to create ionization in that part of the cloud, which could be, uh, as I said before, deep within where the photons cannot reach. And uh, yeah, uh, cosmic rays, we support cosmic rays can sustain that temperature. And uh, going on to my conclusions, um, we support that uh, cosmic rays are an important feedback mechanism, especially in environments where they are expected to be present. Uh, they can penetrate and produce secondary UV ionization and boost, uh, especially the low ionization emission lines, which uh, combined with the fact that they do not affect H-alpha, H-beta, and somehow in between oxygen-3, uh, is the reason behind the movement of the PPT uh, model, of the models in the PPT towards the linear Seifert AGN area. And uh, we did that uh, by sustaining a solar metallicity, not a super solar metallicity. So we made a more realistic uh, assumption to our models. So thank you so much. <laughs> if you have any questions. And uh, it is time for questions, if there are any. Yeah. Any of Thank you. I was impressed by the so the, the full range of uh, ionization rates yes. that are reasonable to think about. Yes. Uh, now, if we regard the Milky Way, mm -hmm. uh, you want you, you could ten to minus sixteen. Yes. So sixteen, seventeen. I, I had uh, in mind the ten to minus seventeen. <laughs> Perhaps okay. it's the central part. Or? Uh, I believe in the central molecular areas in the Milky Way, it, it can go up to 10 to the minus 14. Uh, so there are the values part, yeah. yeah, in the certain yeah. part of the Milky Way that have uh, that kind of cosmic rays, uh, so cosmic ray rate. It's interesting to see that there should be a decrease with radius, radius uh, by factor. Uh, uh, yes, uh, this is not quite special. We, we have not uh, specially analyzed the models. Uh, but we assume that this high cosmic rays and the production of these lines is mainly uh, in the areas near the jet or uh, towards the central area of uh, uh, the nucleus and the galaxy. Any, any things producing cosmic rays? What? Any, any objects, supernovae and so on, producing cosmic rays? Uh, any pro producing the cosmic rays, they, they will influence the environment. 
So it's, it's uh, yes, uh, <laughs> uh, um, um, correct me if I answer in a different way. Uh, if it was molecular, for example, gas, the, the, their behavior would be different. They, they wouldn't uh, just heat and excite, there would be also chemistry uh, involved. So there it would be more complicated. But for the ionized gas, uh, the effect is uh, mostly that, if I'm getting. And do, do we now understand the relationship with the star formation models well, or it's still a... Uh, uh, what we wanted mainly to do is that we wanted to see if a spectrum uh, that does not contain that much of high uh, energy photons has the same uh, influence in the PPT uh, diagrams, has the same behavior. And we wanted to have a galaxy that does not have such an energetic photons to, to compare. Mm -hmm. And uh, luckily enough, NGC 253 also has cosmic ionization rate measurements. So this makes it more uh, constrained uh, for us. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, very important physics for many <laughs> other aspects. Let, let's sure. hope. <laughs> No. So, are there are any other questions? If not, we thank Vini again. Thank you. And, uh, uh, we proceed to the talk of Apollinari. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Dynamical friction, a case study on its effect on the tails of global cluster and its application in galactic systems. Okay. Hi, I am uh, Katerina Vutriandafilaki and I am a PhD student in TART Observatory in Estonia. I am supervised by Ryan Keeper and Telmo Tempel, but some people from post know him because of foremost. Uh, my research on my PhD is to find uh, the effects of dynamical friction on different environments. And uh, currently what I'm working on is uh, how it affects streams and uh, the streams from globular clusters in particular. Uh, so, globular clusters, it's known that uh, they are compact uh, stellar associations, but uh, there are a lot of questions that uh, remain unanswered about them, like uh, how, why they exist and how do they evolve, but from uh, their own motions we can trace uh, some of their characteristics. In my work I mostly focused on creating a, re a recipe for, in order to account for perturbations uh, in the globular cluster arms and uh, streams. Here is uh, a work of uh, Flamen Dateburg on uh, the open clusters of uh, our galaxy. And there is already there a asymmetry on uh, the arms of uh, the cluster. Yeah, I focused on globular clusters, but this was the incentive that started me searching for that. So, no?
Yeah, no, it moved. I moved. I moved from here. Uh, so in the, the tails and the, the arms of the globular clusters, we are able in order to trace some of their past the, in, their orb, in the orbit of the globular clusters in order to, there there will be the imprints of uh, their encounter history, like uh, the different potentials they encounter or evidence of uh, disturbances that uh, they, walked, they walked through. Uh, in the asymmetries of the globular cluster stars, we can uh, search of uh, the effect of the potential of uh, the Milky Way, uh, different uh, uh, dark matter uh, uh, potentials, what uh, is actually conquering uh, our galaxy, the effect of disks, the bars, and the spirals. And uh, uh, the research uh, mostly on the gaps on the streams is focusing on dark matter subhalos. But uh, we aim to take it a, a step further on uh, gas inhomogeneities, and especially the ones that are created by super bubbles, which are the explosion of many supernovae in an area of a galaxy. So, how do we do this? Uh, my my piece is focusing on dynamical friction and how it uh, uh, affects different environments. So, this is as also Francesca Fragudi said in the first days it is when a bigger body, body is falling into a pool of smaller uh, particles, and this creates um, a, a, a gathering of this particle behind the body, creating a, a drag force. This drag force is a dynamical friction. Uh, this drag force creates this of a density of small particles be behind the main body, uh, which results to the bigger body being uh, uh, deaccelerated. In the second image, we can see uh, the acceleration field that uh, a bigger body created on a smaller field. And this is something that was uh, firstly uh, studied by Drasegar in a homogeneous environment. Uh, that he connected the velocity dispersion of the system and, uh, and the velocity of the body. So the method that I'm using is called Back to the Present. It, is, it was firstly uh, introduced in the paper by my supervisor in 2023. And it's a method uh, based on orbit integration. We have uh, two scenarios, one that we called the unperturbed scenario that only has uh, the host. We use this scenario, we uh, integrate uh, the stars or particles of the system. Then we go back, uh, we, go, we integrate them back to the past. Then we add uh, an extra potential, that of the perturber. And then we accelerate them back to the present. Uh, the first potential, the perturber, is only the one of the Milky Way. Then uh, it is the Milky Way, in my case, and the globular cluster. For the globular cluster, I use the plumber potential. Uh, the, two, the two different uh, acceleration fields that I get uh, from this will give us the dynamical friction. And uh, yeah, in this plot, the smaller uh, dots, we can see the, different, the difference of the positions uh, that is uh, happening in a bigger system and how much it is affecting them. So as I focused on uh, uh, the globular clusters, I needed the globular clusters orbit. So I used the catalog from Bombard uh, uh, that had many globular clusters. And in order to set my, re my recipe, I needed the orbit of the globular cluster. I needed some points where I should, can measure the acceleration, where uh, the ones that uh, would measure it better would be the ones that are near the globular cluster, either on the stream or on nearby regions around the stream. And the environment where I would uh, uh, accelerate this body, which was uh, a Milky Way-like environment that I described it through its density. Uh, of uh, the disk and the hull of the Milky Way, which is uh, uh, their gang potentials. So, yes, I used uh, the Milky Way potential as uh, the density environment. The globular cluster, as I said, was a plumber potential, and uh, the integration was done with Runge Kuta with very small steps. And there were many things that I had to take into account in order to make this recipe work, like how far to the past should I uh, integrate the stars? Like uh, if I took it back to 50 giga years, it wouldn't make sense because the universe wouldn't exist. Uh, so I, I created a, a code that tested how far to the past that the code converges and gives the same results, both in time and the distance, uh, how long to the past between the perturber and the, uh, and the center of the Milky Way. And if these environments that I was working on are, are they good and how big these environments should be? 
uh, the whole Milky Way would be a big, too big uh, structure in order to, uh, to uh, it would be too big structure with too many points. So I cut a region that is close to the globular cluster and is following the globular cluster uh, like a cylinder. And uh, this is where I uh, measured the dynamical friction. From this uh, region, we, I created also different tests to see how big it should be. And in uh, the second plot here, we see that uh, as much as I make the cylinder bigger, this is the actual uh, the size that I added to the, cylinder, the initial cylinder. Uh, at some point, the results converge uh, more or less. So there is a region that uh, includes the globular cluster and it is okay for, to use and not take the whole Milky Way. And yeah, that was also done by Sandra Segar in the past in a homogeneous environment. The Milky Way is not a homogeneous environment, but still we tested the Sandra Segar formula with uh, a dynamical friction measured from this method. And we see that for the halo, it agrees with uh, uh, what we measured uh, uh, in uh, the globular cluster of the system. Huh. And yes, so I created this kind of plots that show uh, the globular cluster as it crosses through the disk and the effect of the dynamical friction. Uh, in a plane uh, and measuring this effect, uh, I measured it both on the disk and the hull of the Milky Way. And uh, we, the, the measurement showed that uh, the disk has two times more effect uh, than the hull, which is kind of obvious because it's a more, uh, it's a more dense region. Then, uh, then, like this. No? Oh. Then I also measured the difference in uh, the angular momentum of the stars that are on the uh, on the stream or a bit up and down. And uh, we see that uh, in this plane that the difference is less than 10%, but this uh, change of, uh, the, of uh, angular momentum can result into, uh, depending on how, or how many times the globular cluster passes through the disk, into around the velocity change of uh, 0.1 kilometers per second in uh, one, Giga year. This still depends on which global cluster it is, uh, how far away it is from the center, and uh, and how many times it passes the disk. The more times it passes, the more effect it will be. Yeah, and here, yes, and here again we can see. Can we? Again, it's a very similar plot that we see. Uh, the, uh, the, the the where the acceleration is pointing, while the globular cluster is. Uh, crossing the uh, the disk, which is the point that we see, and the, the stars are pulled towards the perturbation, getting away from the disk, and then to the opposite direction. My research did not. Yeah, this research does not stop there. While this will be the focus of uh, my paper, there is also other dynamical friction-like effects, like uh, the ones in the super bubbles. Uh, in a paper that is will be published, uh, will be officially published, uh, and it's already in our archive. We saw that super bubbles, while they expand, they can accelerate or deaccelerate the stars uh, that they pass through them. The effect from a super bubble will always be towards the outside. And uh, and uh, this will create different inhomogeneities on the gas disk. The first approach, we saw that the, the secular evolution of the galaxy gas will be very low, like 10%. But then uh, we, we got a, a referee reply and uh, this uh, very spherical uh, bubble was not uh, the realistic environment. And, uh, searching uh, the bubbles in the galaxy, they were more uh, elongated than sheared. So a very preliminary work shows that when the bubble is sheared, the effect is much stronger. There are a lot of things that need to be taken into account. For, for example, a super bubble lasts uh, around 30 mega years. So it's a, short effect, it's a short effect for one bubble, but if there are many of them in the galaxy, it can have a much stronger effect uh, on the orbits of the stars and mostly in the kinematics of the gas. And um, yeah, later, uh, what we have also 
seen is if uh, uh, the if uh, the dynamical friction can be a reason for seeing gaps also in other galaxies this uh, is a mock uh, stream from uh, Agans et al that uh, they are preparing the research from the roman telescope and uh, they are simulating a stream like a polymer of five uh, uh, globular cluster in its stream and uh, there is a sub halo that is passing it and it's creating this effect uh, their paper is focusing on how well the, detec the detection from the roman telescope will be but uh, uh, we we are repeating this kind of same research to see if uh, dynamical friction can be also an added effect on this or not and if uh, this uh, can be compared with their data or if it will even be something that will be detected and there is more work to be done that we have done very little steps and it's kind of preliminary in the paper of Anetal uh, in 2024 uh, there is uh, a work uh, there is uh, a measurement that uh, the center of uh, of uh, the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy that has fallen into the Milky Way and it's uh, possibly nuclear stellar cluster it have uh, a different in the centers uh, using this dynamical friction scenario, we measured that uh, uh, up to 10% of uh, uh, this offset could be a reason, uh, could be a result of the dynamical friction. Uh, and later, where my research will foc focus on from November, will be on the lopsidedness of the galaxies. And uh, uh, we have talked with Ariana Dolphy, we read her paper and uh, uh, in her research in uh, TNG 50, uh, she shows that uh, the, the galaxies that are more lopsided in the history of the universe are the ones who have a less uh, centrally concentrated dark matter halo. And we aim also to search this with uh, the dynamical friction. Uh, also, there is uh, dedicated research from JPAS uh, in order to search for uh, the assembly history and also the lopsided galaxies. Uh, uh, in uh, high redshifts and with different filters. And yeah, that was mostly for me, that uh, uh, the gaps in the, the globular clusters and the difference in the orbits and from what is expected from an idealized uh, potential uh, is something that has a lot of research to come. And uh, uh, through them, we can find the imprints of uh, what effects uh, is happening through the, uh, on, the tails of, on the tails and the streams of the globular clusters. Uh, there is evidence from Banning et al. that subhalos is not the only thing and probably not the one that explains the gaps. Uh, but uh, we can see that, that this can be an important uh, contribution. Uh, now, in the part that we are searching and finishing this paper is on having a more realistic stream and accelerating. Let's see the symmetries on each of uh, the stars that have escaped and then continue with uh, measuring the gas homogeneity from the super bubbles. It, it has already been done, but using a more realistic stream, not yet. So it's in the upcoming two weeks. And also use this uh, method for uh, the other environments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? Thank you for an interesting talk. I wonder, we don't know that there are like that many global clusters in general. There are like 200, I think it's about right. 200 global clusters. I think clusters. they are 88 in the catalog. It, it, even smaller. So, and we know that they are quite distributed in a physical space. So, how? Many global clusters actually in one stream. So, uh, like okay, but it's ten or. Okay, it's this effect should be in every of the globe in, in every in each one of the globular clusters because they are all, at some point, passing through the disk. But the ones that have uh, the strongest effect are within the four, three to four kiloparsecs from the center. So. Maybe I missed <laughs> the general thing, so sorry for probably a very naive question. So it's global cluster passing through the potential of the galaxy, and then part of that is just like leave the global cluster. Or, or what do you mean by this? Uh, uh, 
Ah, the, uh, the, the, the stars uh, escape from the globular cluster from the Lagrangian points. And yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Uh, so what I have done in order to have a more realistic environment is to use a point spread method for them to get away. But uh, we know that the global clusters are actually not like collision-less systems. I think they relax in time. So the stars should escape the global clusters due to relaxation effects, no? During what? Due to relaxation effects. Do you know what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how uh, we have measured the, the stars that escape the globular cluster. Uh, yes. OK, and one more thing I, I'm interested in. You mentioned Milky Way potential. Yeah, so, but what it's kind of not like set in stone potential, you know, <laughs> especially in the center part of our so, galaxy. So how you, how you approach the problem? Because OK, yes, some... uh, it's uh, the Ergang uh, potential, uh, the Ergang model one potential from his paper 2014, the halo is uh, Miyamoto, uh, the halo is an FW halo, and uh, the disk is uh, the disk and the bulbs are from Miyamoto Nagai with different coefficients. So there is like no bar, spirals, and there is bulbs, there are no spirals and bars. Okay, thank you. If you look at the distribution of the inner globular clusters, you from the top. You see, they are aligned with the bar. The what? They, they are aligned with the, the Milky Way bar. So it shows the correlation between the two. I, I haven't checked the that. The inner cluster. Well, that's, that's interesting because you know there is uh, something that's. This, uh, families of orbs that appear in rotating <laughs> triaxial potentials. And I have never encountered, let's say, a feature that can be attributed to the stable anomalous orbit or something like that. They are always there, but uh, something should be yeah, probably. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, so uh, are there any other questions? No, then we thank uh, Katarina again first. <laughs> So we came to an end with uh, all our presentations. Let's have some coffee and let's come back uh, to have some final discussions. And uh, then this will be. So coffee time. Okay, and uh, so I wanted to to hear from you if you have if you think that some uh, of the hot topics on the subject should be discussed or things that uh, we may share opinions uh, about. All uh, we speak up, all of us speak about bars and spirals, and I think that. Uh, Actually, there are three main perspectives that uh, people attack uh, these objects and try to understand how they work. So if we can put three categories, we can say that there are, of course, the observations, then there are the embodied simulations, and then this is the, I would say, old-fashioned maybe way of the orbital theory. But all these three things have to be combined. And I think that... Uh, all of us have to uh, 
gain from the expertise of people that are working on the other fields in their understandings. So is someone else who has a specific question that we can start a discussion? I'm sure that you have it, but <laughs> how to formulate it? Well, uh, let, let me pose a question like that. With all of us see in the sky, in the unbody simulations and the orbital model spirals. So what do you think how they are, these uh, spirals interconnected? Do you think that we look at uh, objects that they have the similar have similar properties? Of course, everybody has to try to model <laughs> what we, the observers tell us, but, but okay. Are all spirals the same? We had the, the spirals of the density wave theory. We have the spirals of the manifolds and we have the spirals that uh, on the sky where we, have, we see the young objects, the dust lanes and all that stuff. And maybe what should uh, we care more about that is the longevity of these features. Do you think that, uh, let's say, is somebody who wants to comment about that do we speak about transient or uh, stationary? I wouldn't say not even quite stationary, but longer living uh, spirals. So, Alexander, yeah. Ah, uh, let me. Help you. Uh, well, uh, yeah. So. I work with observations. I also really appreciate all this uh, mathem mathematical background behind uh, and body simulations okay. and uh, what we observe. But like uh, the more I see in the sky, like real spiral arms, they look that doesn't uh, does look symmetric. Most of all, they are not grand design, most of them. I slightly shifted from the like density wave perspective and like, uh, I don't know, global modes or something like that to the dynamic, but I suspect that this shift, like in my belief, it is not because uh, they are like that. This is because uh, it's just very difficult to find certain uh, properties which we kind of expect but didn't find them so probably like some uh well yeah so for me i would be like very interested to know how like if you get the orbital theory pers perspective well like kind of expect a symmetrical pattern how this picture can be distorted by real physics, which of course also uh, like ongoing in the real disks, how, how uh, the matter of perspective can be distorted like in real situations. So how we can adjust these predictions, well, like for example, we expect some pitch angles, of course they are going like from the potential, like directly what we should expect, but how they, but in the like, SPH simulations, we see this like very distorted, like narrow spiral arms with a lot of bands and something like that. So it will be nice to know how, like, yeah, how, because like this orbital perspective can be, I assume, this is my assumption, it can be completely destroyed if the physics is uh, violent enough. Yeah, yeah, like in the like, extreme case, in the most extreme case, yeah. So, well, maybe I will add something later, but it's just like for the start too. Okay, so uh, is anyone who wants to comment on that uh, more? Well, actually for classifying uh, the spirals, I think one has to uh, do that in a consistent way. I was surprised to see that in most cases, if you look at the near infrared, 
you could find an inner part of the spirals that are quite symmetric. Although, okay, if you uh, look at atlases or in the internet, etc., okay, the first thing that you see, okay, galaxy certainly uh, is asymmetric. But if you go over, I would say, one, two scale, exponential scale lengths of the disk, this distance from the center, which actually is about the, the size that also the bar occupies, then uh, I, had, I remember I have seen, shown one case. If you just do some uh, elementary image processing, then you see that you can find an inner symmetric part in several cases, in many cases, much more than you one would expect it. And this is bisymmetric, so one can speak about the grand design. Then later out, it is distorted. So, and certainly this is also in the near infrared, where you see the old stellar population of the disk. So, okay, anybody else who would like to, to speak about it? Yes, uh, just um, <clears throat> a word about uh, what we do. In fact, uh, we have reality, which can be messy, and the models, which are idealized. So remember, I remember the, yesterday the, the visit <laughs> to the, the Parthenon, where there is an ideal of nice women, new woman. They should be as, as that, but in reality, it's all different. And we have this uh, wish, it's a human nature, to have a perfect symmetry and so on. But we, and so we make model, model. And the utility of having this simple model is that we can understand, we can have a rational uh, uh, construction, mental construction. So we do that, but we shouldn't uh, believe these models are reality. There's just a simplification of reality. And then if we add perturbations, we destroy the symmetries and so on. But behind this, there is some uh, fundamental, the, the most basic physics is expressed by the simple model. So that's why we do uh, orbit, orbit models. It's very simple, but it captures the essential of the gravitational field, just alone. And then we can add uh, perhaps gas, and then we perturb that. And if it's not too far from this model, then we have a, uh, we can uh, reproduce a better reality. In fact, for example, in bar we have this dust lane which can be seen into when we introduce some dissipation. And otherwise, it's very important for theorists to to look at nature because. Uh, remind that uh, reality is always more complex. And I have appreciated, for example, this picture of the, um, the inner bar, I don't remember the NGC number, but we had, you had the inner disk and the dust lane in the bar with the uh, HST resolution. It's an uh, excellent example of uh, inspired for, for the physics going on in this, so you see this dust lane, uh, they, they are water, not just dust, it's molecular clouds that contain dust and they are cold and they don't form stars, you don't see much stars. But when they arrive in the ring, you see a lot of blue stars and so on. It's, it's teach a lot on the star formation process, what, what are the conditions to make stars, it's still a, a big mystery, this star formation process. So it's um, very useful for terrorists to understand the limits of what we understand, what we don't, what, where we can make a simple model to understand something, but not to think these models are, are real. <laughs> I fully agree with that. Uh, we have, we know that nature is complex. That's why we go try even to implement the chaos theory to understand this complexity in nature. And remember that uh, it was not only the wrong impression that uh, the Earth was the center of the solar system that uh, delayed the evolution, but also that people thought about idealized orbits which were circular. It was uh, a, a, a leap in, in, uh, 
in thinking that uh, we have to destroy the perfection of the circles so that we understand how nature works. Nature is complex. Okay. So, yeah, please. It just um, made me think when you were talking about comparing observations to simulations and how we have all of these different kinds of ways of looking at the universe and we're trying to connect between the between them. I mean, people can correct me if they don't agree with this, but one of the gold standards that we seem to have now with our hydrodynamic, magnetohydrodynamic simulations is we often try to take synthetic observations so that you can compare the two to each other more realistically, right? You, you use the same PSF, uh, you know, all of the... I'm a theorist, I don't know all the things that happen in observations. Um, but then, because you know, sometimes you look at uh, objects in different wavelengths, you see completely different features. If you really want to compare your simulation to your observation and know whether or not you're looking at the same stuff or not, sometimes it's, it's better to do that. But I don't know as much about n-body simulations. Are synthetic observations something that people are doing with n-body simulations? Does that even make sense to do? Or would that not be helpful? Does anyone know? There, there is, there's synthetic observations from embody stuff. So I'm pretty sure there are more catalogs, but then you have other things because you have to assume, you have to assume some things. You have to assume, uh, no, you have to assume how you would observe them. So you have to assume, for example, extinction curve. You have to assume other things to be comparable and then there's another question of oh do they not match because simulation don't match or because the things you assume don't match so it gets a, a layer of of complexity yeah so well this is of course uh, always the issue uh a point that uh could also discuss is we have all these nice and body simulations. How close do you think that uh, we are to the real galaxies, Leah? Do you, okay, for the bars, I think it is a big progress because there you see even details. But in general, are the snapshots we have on our computers close to what we see in the sky? first would like to say that I hope so, that they are the same and everything. But there is a lot of work. If you look from the very beginning to what is now, you will see that there's an, a tremendous advance, tremendous. Unfortunately, spirals are not exactly the same. It doesn't go as far. There have been many efforts. I spent, I don't know how many years, no, months of my, of my life, trying to get manifolds straight and how we needed them and why and how and etc. Um, th th there, there has been effort, but it's not proportional to what we achieved. The same people we achieved with the bars. That I think is what I would say. I don't know if somebody else has things that... Uh, So <laughs> that means that people are not sure about... <laughs> not sure about bars? Oh my God, yeah, say. that's bad for okay. me. <laughs> True. Well, oh, behind that it is that we don't know, of course, but uh, let's share some thoughts. For instance, I find uh, very intriguing that uh, if uh, uh, in some, uh, let's say not strongly barred galaxies, or if we can speak about non-barred galaxies in the spirals, you see the expected succession for a wave that is inside corrotation. So you have the dust lanes, you have the young uh, stars, etc. So you say, okay, look, uh, I can understand that. And then I have the star formation happening when uh, this point of view expects. But then we go to the other kind of spirals, the manifolds, and there we have also star formation. Then how can we find the right succession or how can we describe star formation there? If we could have some prediction, then would be a very good observational test 
for saying here we have a manifold spiral. It is difficult, for instance, to go there and try to uh, measure dispersion of velocities and, and the stellar component and all that stuff. But we can one has tried to establish some observational criteria that can distinguish the two kind of flows because we have two kind, different kind of flows. Well, with the manifolds, it is a very nice picture. It's a lovely picture. And it, it, it can do well with a lot of the parts. But then not all of it. There are parts with the manifolds which are not really what we want. Uh, I think Vela should be talking now. Uh, so, yes, Mirella. Mirella, we were talking about manifold. So, you know, you're a bit of an expert there. And would you like to tell us? I, I, I thought that I spent a lot of time, got somewhere, but not as far as proportional I got with the bars. So, would you like to comment on something like that? Now, we're um, uh, an ongoing uh, work on uh, uh, 3D models. And we try to find, um, for the manifolds, we try to find some correlations uh, between the, the strength of the bar and the morphology of the manifolds. When, uh, for example, there are uh, 3D orbits, even sticky chaotic orbits, and when they are projected, they still support uh, manifolds for very long times. So we try to find something like, for example, we can see in observations, uh, if the strength of the bar uh, is not uh, big, uh, then um, we see that we uh, have uh, more or less uh, rings, rather rings, rather than manifolds. This is something new that we, it's an ongoing work now. And we want, yes, to see and if the strength of the bar is, uh, uh, if the bar is stronger, then uh, uh, the, for the same time of integration of the orbits, of the chaotic orbits, then we have um, manif open manifolds that go in uh, uh, longer distances. So we, we, we want now to try to test with, because we have seen uh, some, uh, observational um, papers from Buta, Lori Cannon, all these that have uh, atlas of uh, of uh, a lot of uh, bar spar galaxies, and we uh, observe that uh, when the the strength of the bar is not very very big, it's uh, small, then mostly we see rings and not spar arms, and we want to see now because we see that this. Um, even if we have a third dimension, a 4D phase space, there is still stickiness of these uh, chaotic orbits that uh, uh, they could uh, 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 diffuse through the third dimension easily, but uh, they still stay there for a very long time supporting these structures. And we want to see uh, in what um, surfaces they are sticky to, because in the 2D, uh, we have seen the stickiness in the manifolds, the stickiness of the chaotic orbits in the manifolds, because the manifolds always form the paths along which all the chaotic orbits should move before diffusing outwards. But in, when we have three dimensions in the four different space, we must find that the, there should be other surfaces along which the, the, the sticky orbits should stay, should stay there. So we want to study th this uh, uh, for example, what kind of uh, surfaces? Uh, are... Because Marcos have uh, made this uh, uh, study in um, other potentials, in chemical potentials. I want to see if this works also for the spirals, for the bar spiral galaxies. Station of periodic orbits in the Hamiltonian systems to three degrees or more degrees of freedom. And this has been used a lot in molecular and atomic physics. Well, this was great. This was very interesting. I 
one the one thing you are going to compare things and you want to see how nicely they go together or how badly they go together. It's, it's a surprise. It's a big surprise. Um, but have you put a lot of effort into finding what I will call a parameter, what I will call a particular thing which I want to compare. It's not the same as if I, I compare with him and he can, she compares with the other one over there. So we have to try and get this. And if you have anything, maybe people, it's, maybe it's getting too much of a detail, but I think that the most important part would be to get those parameters correctly to start with, and then don't lose time just with the back. There are, it's true that there are a lot of parameters. I mean, you have to try first to have a bar only potential, then you have to try to change the pattern speed, then you have to put a spiral potential and all these things uh, change, for example, but we, you have to start from some, some, something and um, uh, make a study there and try to see if there are some colleagues and then put uh, another parameters and, uh, and go, so go on. Yes, it's, uh, it has a lot of parameters. Yeah, that's true. So I, I, don't, I don't really work with spywarms and I'm, I think I'm very ignorant on that, but are we expecting them they to be different phenomenon on galaxies with and without bars? When uh, we, we do not have bars, uh, because there is no so much chaos in the region of correlation, then we say that we can support, uh, even with order orbits, uh, such as precessing ellipses, as we have seen, uh, according to the density wave theory, we can support a, a, a good spiral density wave. But when there is a bar at the correlation, there is a lot of chaos. So there was, for many years, a great puzzle uh, for the astronomers, what kind of orbits support the spiral arms uh, with so much chaos in, in the region. And then we uh, have the, the idea of the, of the manifolds. I mean, the chaotic orbits, this is not randomness. This is deterministic chaos, as pa Panos have said. So uh, one can um, uh, uh, integrate and see the, the, the determine these chaotic orbits. And these chaotic orbits um, have always to uh, diffuse outwards uh, uh, along paths. And these paths are made from the um, unstable manifolds of the unstable periodic orbits of these regions, not only the Lagrangian points, L1 and L2, but every uh, unstable periodic orbit in the region uh, have manifolds that, that forms uh, the path along which the, the chaotic orbits are forced to move uh, because the manifolds make uh, a lot of recurrences back and forth, then they spend a lot of time in and out supporting the structure, supporting these spiral arms before escaping from the system. Spirals with bars when we talk about manifolds and we have the density wave theory, which is another theory with order orbits when we talk about normal galaxies without a bar. Bar introduces a lot of chaos. The way I understand um, this uh, manifold uh, view is, um, in fact, um, is in uh, apparent contradiction with what I said about uh, different pattern speed of the spiral and the uh, bar. So the way to reconcile this is to make, um, say, in the, you take the bar as a reference, you take a constant pattern speed, and then you make an average theory in time of the spiral arms. And then the average over time, because the phase is different, must be axisymmetric. So it's a strange situation. Um, and then the Lagrange points are fixed. But otherwise, if you have two patterns interacting, there is no fixed point. So 
I would like to see something like a, uh, an average Hamiltonian theory of the spiral arms interacting with the fixed spiral in the rotating frame. That could be, uh, there, there, there must be some, uh, some manifold from the Lagrange points. And the other point is um, what I knew from studies of the, this, the stability of the Lagrange points is that if the bar is too strong, then the L4 gets unstable. And this is very decisive for the manifold. The manifold that follow the separatrix is going to, to change and could have, a, I, I have not look at that, but that's uh, the consequence in the third dim dimension. And so it would be interesting to see. I think, uh, Daniel, that when you have the strong bar, then this is good news for the manifold spirals. And the reason is that the L4, L5 are unstable. And then whatever material you have over there start going towards the L1, then it is uh, trapped by the manifold and ejected outside. And that's why in strong bars, you see the sides of the bar to be empty. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah I would relate indeed. Yeah. A bar becoming evolving and becoming too strong should empty the, the, empty the yeah exactly exactly and this uh, so there was someone else uh, okay uh, Mat Matia and then okay, let's start with Matia and then Francesca then Mirella again um, <clears throat> so I'm not very knowledgeable about the manifold theory but just a, a naive question if you take um, <clears throat> an end-body simulation like the one that uh, Jerry Selwood has done for, for many years uh, studying the spirals. Um, are the spirals in these simulations um, manifolds? Uh, are they explainable with the manifolds theory? Is this already been tested or can it be tested? Um, there are models with two pattern speeds and manifolds. Mirella has done something on that. The question for many years was that uh, we see that sometimes the spirals have different pattern speed than the bar. So the question is how the manifold theory works uh, when we have two different pattern speeds. And we have tested um, a theory using uh, normal form uh, transformation of the Hamiltonian. And uh, we have used the, um, uh, the difference of the two pattern speeds of the bar and the spiral arms. We have made the test. And we have uh, seen that the manifold theory can um, uh, work in this also, in this scenario, when we have uh, uh, two different uh, pattern speed, but then the, the manifolds are um, uh, not stable. I mean, uh, they move also with, with time. We have, uh, this is a theory, I mean, yeah. Is it possible to test, uh, like I take an end-body simulation, I have the spirals, I take particles on the spirals, I follow the orbits, can I say these part together, they form a manifold or, or not? Is it possible? Work from uh, Christos Miopoulos. Uh, you can take, you can um, take a frequency analysis, like Selwood did in all this, and uh, determine uh, the pattern speed, the, the different pattern speeds of the simulation using this frequency analysis. And then you can take, um, for example, you may find one pattern speed or you may find two different or even three different pattern speeds. And then you can construct your uh, model according to manifold theory using the, 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 the pattern speed that you have found out of the, the simulation. And well, well, this is an approximation because sometimes uh, the pattern speed even changes with the, the radius. It's not constant uh, all over. The, but you can make an assumption that um, for when uh, it, uh, the system is relaxed, you can um, clearly found that there are two different pattern speed out of the simulation. And then you can, uh, and then you, you uh, froze the, you can, um, you take a frozen potential, when to relax, and you can do all this orbital analysis, and then you can test with the real um, densities, with the real, uh, with the real simulation, uh, with the equipotentials so or the equidensities of the real simulations, what you find with the manifolds. You can test if they fit well, for example. So this is an approximation, okay. I think a, a 
critical quantity is this pattern speed. If you have a pattern speed, and so already Mirella said that uh, she finds that uh, this is not that constant with radius, but let's say that you have, you believe that you have in the snapshot, you want to analyze a pattern speed. Then I believe a first uh, test would be to see just uh, the, the velocity vectors. If they go, if the particles, the stars, whatever, they go through the arms or along the arms. So this, this would be a good indication if you deal with a, a regular or with a chaotic spiral. Okay, but this seems, sounds like a simple test to me. So is it yeah, done? Yeah. And what's the result? It's been done. Yes, it's been done, but what's the result? <laughs> so it's always the manifold theory. Not always, some cases. Okay. No, I, of course, but like I could take, one could take, I don't know, the cosmological Auriga simulation and make this simple test, right? It would be something that can be done in quite, Obviously, in some cases, yes, in some cases, not. <laughs> Nobody can say, well, I'm sure 100% this is the correct theory and nothing else. I mean, we, have, we test, we test and we uh, compare with simulations, uh, with observations. There are very, some interesting cases where there is a spiral inside a spiral, a, sp a panos, uh, so um, where uh, the two theories can coexist. I mean, you can have the density wave theory that um, um, give the inner, the inner spiral arm, and you can have the manifold theory that gives the outer spiral arm. Okay. Uh, uh, another, another, I immediately will come to Francesca. She wants to say something. Another is a very simple test. Just take, a, if you see a bar and then a spiral, well, you can bet, you can know whether this is, of course, not a scientific uh, procedure, but if the Lagrangian points are far away, then you have less chances to have a manifold spiral. You need close to the end of the bar to have material that will be transferred. So if these are these uh, slow bars that we have seen there about something like the curly air to be three or something, then you have to find to try to find for uh, material from the end of the bar, bring them up there, and then continue to uh, a, a chaotic spiral. It can be done, but it's much more difficult than having it at the end of the bar who you have forcing and material to bring them directly uh, along the manifold. What do you there think? is such problems. There are problems. I don't, I don't try to hide them, but they are not the same problems. Jerry Selman's thing also is full of problems, but it doesn't mean that it goes away. So uh, maybe just to reply to what Mattia was saying, I have two comments, but one quick comment to what Mattia was asking. I think there are studies like what Leah was saying, where you see in N-body simulations the orbits that look very much like manifolds, they're coming out of the ends of the bar, et cetera. I think to me, one key question that still, I'm not sure if we know the answer to, maybe maybe Leah or Mirella know the answer, is whether this is a dominant mechanism in terms of the mass that's in the spirals, because you can definitely see the orbits doing these motions coming out into the spiral arm from the Lagrange points, but then is that most of the mass that's in the spiral, I think that's an interesting question. And then my second comment, if I can. So I was wondering what, because um, Mirella was mentioning the spiral density wave theory for 
for non-barred galaxies. Um, but it was my understanding that in a lot of n-body simulations nowadays, they find actually that if they don't have a bar and they just have spiral arms, that these spiral arms are often um, transient features and that they have a pattern speed that actually uh, corrotates with the disk. And so they're kind of transient shearing features. I wonder if we have any understanding for how to explain those kinds of spiral arms that we see in n-body simulations without a bar. Well, if I may say something on that, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, but here's a question. Yeah, then I will put another question after that comment. <laughs> so if we do not have a bar, and then you have a spiral, and okay, if you look in galaxies, you see this nice succession of dust lanes and young objects, etc. then I believe these are this kind of flow I usually describe as precessing ellipsis flow. So something that it is an extrapolation of a density wave theory to open spirals. There, are, there is non-linear phenomena taking place there, but there are this kind of spirals, I don't believe that they are uh, manifold spirals. It's the other thing. So both may coexist, but okay. Uh, should we maybe, there are other issues that one has to introduce or, Daniel. Yes, uh, about this uh, manifold theory. Um, I think you, you, we should uh, compare it with uh, what we do with the periodic orbits. So one dimensional invariant set in phase space, which is useful when the set is stable. And so it attracts around uh, some, some, some particles. In the case of manifold, it's two-dimensional set, invariant set, as, as the name in, indicates. So it's as useful as the periodic orbit, as long as this manifold has some stability in, in it. So in two dimension, you can have uh, one unstable, one stable. But when it's half stable, so, or half unstable, uh, it has some usefulness for, for a while, and after that, it dilutes away. And when it is doubly unstable, it has no, no use as unstable periodic orbits are not useful. But the fact that periodic orbits are useful for explaining dark galaxies, I think these invariant sets are useful. They must be there. If, if provide, to some extent, they must structure the, the motion around them. So I'm not astonished that if you look in the body simulation, you will find some some resemblance because phase space is structured in this way. So that's not a wonder. So I, I wouldn't question the, is this theory real or not or true? <laughs> it's just the face, if you adopt a phase space, you have a structure so that, that belongs to. Uh, and it, depending on the properties of this invariant set, it can be useful or not. Uh, here comes an unusual point of view. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, maybe I just want to like take a, take a note when we compare bars and spirals, we kind of assume that they're like close entities, it's like close, uh, qualitatively close things. But is it indeed so? Because you know the bars are, the spirals are known as the things that transfer angular momentum outside. They actually participate in transferring angular momentum outside. And that's just what they do. The bar on the other side, they, well, they can participate in transferring the angular momentum in the gala, for example. But they actually, you can have models where the bars do not evolve. They're just stable, rotating ellipsoids. So they are like, you think you have one thing that, that participates in continuous changing of the system, probably because it should, it should transfer angular momentum. And the other thing that just 
rotating and don't like, of course it affects the other things in the list, but it's actually like very stable thing. That's the first thing I would like to note. The second thing I would like to note is that the bars, uh, as in general, like in stability, can be found as the solution of collision Boltzmann equation in the linear regime. You can like solve the collision Boltzmann equation and obtain the, the unstable modes. But can we do the same for spirals? <sighs> the answer is kind of complicated. I think that to the present day, like mostly the answer is mostly like no. No, we cannot. There can be spirals, but they're like short-lived modes. And that's the problem. So, so I don't know about, uh, like, can we, but because, of, because of these things, can we in the end, in principle, have a theory for long-lived spirals? I, I don't know if they are not like, if there are like no solutions for collisionless Boltzmann equation, maybe we should introduce the like collision term, of course, maybe that's where we should go, but it's kind of complicated. So they're like, I would, in my talk, I would just would like to mention these two like very general issues that we have with spirals. Thank you. Sure, open questions, of course. So for someone else who has raised the hand, no. Uh, well, if you're in the mood to continue the, the, the discussion, we can stop anytime you feel tired, but uh, let me... Uh, okay, Taris, say something again. Yeah, okay, uh, it's not about the manifold theory or anything like this. Uh, so there are a lot of galaxies out there, and some of them, I mean a certain percentage of them, they have spirals. So you, one could extrapolate the duration, I mean, these features are transient or not. So how many giga years should they be around? And how many giga years do we see spirals in simulations? And then if they're, if they're too transient, how do we explain that we see a lot of spirals? And what's the theory? I mean, how many giga years do we need them to exist in simulations, which would be consistent with observations? And what would be the theory to explain them? Is there anyone who wants to comment on that? Well, he, this is the open question. Of course, I think that uh, most people in the room will agree that uh, you easily get transient spirals in the end body simulations. You don't have, let's say, at least as long uh, as long as the the uh, the bars long-lived features. They are transient. On the other hand, if you look at this uh, near infrared observation of the galaxies, and you see that you have a very strong uh, m equal to spiral be symmetric there and this is out of made out of k and m giants the first thing that uh, you think is that the stars have the time to revolve several times around the center of the galaxy fill the potential well and go down to the bottom that's why you see them else how can you do that so it is an open question the fact is still everybody i think uh, has tried that most of the spirals, or if not all of them that you have in nine body simulations, could easier be interpreted as transient than in uh, stationary, of course. Yeah, that's a problem. I think we, we have this huge number of n body simulations available, and the models are quite impressively resembling real galaxies. You can match uh, even the Milky Way in detail and so on. And of course, there is more physics, star formation, uh, cooling, and so on. So I think it's, it's the answer. You, we, we see the simulations are able to reproduce what you, you models of galaxies. We can follow how long these arms live and answer this question, how transient they are. And I think most of the time they are transient. 
and they explain well the observations, uh, but, but we want more. <laughs> it's not because it's, they are not uh, conformed to the density wave theory that they, there is a doubt. I mean, uh, you, you have a, a, a large success of explaining real galaxies by uh, this particular combination of physics. Density wave theory, in any case, in the way of Lin and Su, uh, yeah. refers to weak perturbations. So it could maybe explain SA galaxies. That, yeah. but, but just the idea that uh, spirals are waves, it's not uh, obvious. No, no, okay. Yeah. They can be grouped. So. Yeah, it's not obvious. Because it's... Uh, let me put another question. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, spirals uh, that uh, we can fit their uh, spiral arms with pitch angles from one to, let's say, about 30 degrees. And there is a jump. And then we have bars. There, is, there are no spirals, grand design, if you want, that have uh, 60 degrees. Uh, there are not until 30, uh, when maybe 40, it's an extreme case. Not 50, not 60, not 70. Any idea why? <laughs> I don't have the answer, of course. <laughs> I just hope that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I don't know, and I want to listen to to opinions. But okay, I don't see if anyone wants to comment on that. Uh, okay, the uh, well, the other interesting uh, thing that has been discussed was what uh, Matia has shown us about uh, the streaming motion of the gas towards the centers of the galaxies. So there, I think we had enough over lunch. So <laughs> do you think that we should share some thoughts with the rest of the people? I don't know. It's uh, I, I for me it's also another very interesting, uh, let's say, subject. Uh, trying to see how okay, one can easily bring the gas to the ring, to the inner to the nuclear ring, but then. Uh, how it can drop to the center of the galaxy and feed black holes, etc., without putting at, at hoc a priori black hole there, then it can make it, things easy to let things go in. But how to switch off the black hole, that's what I'm saying. That is another issue that I find very interesting. If one wants to say a few things, maybe Matia, do you want to just to share your thoughts on that? No. So, um, with simulations, we did some, I, I think, very instructive numerical experiments. Essentially, we took uh, uh, a simulation uh, in an external bar potential, which doesn't include uh, star formation or uh, magnetic fields, nothing. And then we see that essentially all the gas stops at the ring and nothing goes from the ring uh, to the center. Uh, and then you run the same simulation, but you add uh, star formation or alternatively magnetic fields. And whatever of the two you do, you, do, you see that the, the, the inside of the ring starts to get filled with, with gas that goes to the center. And in the case of magnetic fields, for example, is because uh, it becomes like uh, one of these uh, uh, magnetized accretion disks where you have the magnetic rotational instability working and uh, this causes some transport of gas to the center. Uh, and when you have star formation, it's also kind of similar. The, the, uh, the, the supernova exploding, they steer the interstellar medium, they redistribute the angular momentum a little bit. And so this continues and drives the gas to the center. Um, so, <clears throat> I, I think one 
once you look inside the, the ring, you should uh, kind of switch uh, framework. Uh, you should think more in the context of, a, of an accretion disk uh, than in the context of, uh, uh, of orbits and galaxy dynamics, maybe. Uh, and then which of the, so I mentioned two processes, star formation and, and magnetic fields, uh, but there can be also other processes that are, um, uh, are relevant. For example, the globular clusters that were mentioned the other day, if there is a globular cluster that comes close to the center, to me it's conceivable that some of the mass in the ring gets thrown to the center. Um, I don't know what the magnetic fields do if uh, they are coupled to the star formation, Maybe they interact non-linearly. Um, and also there could be a nuclear bar. You know, we knew, I don't think we, that was the, but if you have a nuclear bar, then the whole picture changes because then uh, you can have a mini version of the, of the so you, the main bar brings the gas to the ring and then the mini bar brings the gas to much closer to the center. And then you see, so yeah. Does anyone else uh, want to add something, Daniel? Um, just a remark about uh, rings. <laughs> if, they are, if you let these rings be self-gravitating, inside the ring, the, the force is outwards. If it's sufficiently, like it's sufficiently dense, so a uh, uh, hollow ring cannot be stable. You have no circular orbit because the force is outward. So it, it shows that you cannot accumulate too much mass on these rings before cell gravity destroys the ring. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just because uh, there is no circular orbit. Great. Uh, does anyone else want to add something? If not, I think then uh, we could stop our discussion here. It was a pleasure to have all of you here for all these uh, days and uh, exchange our views like we did here and the very nice talks that we had. We, everybody enjoyed that. So I wish you all best uh, success in your research. And uh, I hope that we meet soon again in another meeting. So. Thank you.